Planning and High Waste Committee. Um, I'm going to introduce the rest of the committee to you, first starting with Diane. Good afternoon, Chair. My name is Diane Hurst. I'm an elected member for Richmond Ward. Andrew? Uh, Councillor Andrew Sanger, Councillor for Forward Ward. Adam? You're muted, Adam. <laughs> Councillor Adam Hurst for West Ecclesfield Ward. Alan? Alan Law, first part of Ward. Tony? It's Tony Dams, Councillor for Southie Ward. Peter? Good afternoon, Councillor Peter Price, Councillor for Shire Green Brightside. Lovely. Uh, Peter Garbutt. <laughs> uh, Councillor Peter Garbutt for Nether Edge and Shire Ward. Bob? Uh, Councillor Bob McCann, Councillor for Baton Ward. Zahira? Kieran Rice for Kadana Ward. You're a little bit faint, Zahira, so you might want to sort your audio out. Just that's fine. Uh, Chris? Uh, Chris Rosling Josephs, Councillor for the Baton Ward. And last but not least, Tim. <laughs> uh, Councillor Tim Huggan, Councillor for Crooks and Crossfell Ward. Lovely. And as I said, I'm Councillor Jane Dunn, the chair today, and I'm from Southie Ward. I'll hand over to Abby to do some housekeeping arrangements. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for logging on to this Zoom video conference of the Planning Committee. I'm Abby Brownsword, the Democratic Services Officer for this meeting, and I'm assisted by my colleague, Jay Bell, who is the host of the virtual meeting. We'll proceed, um, we'll do housekeeping keeping in a moment, but just a couple of points. Uh, this meeting is a public meeting and in alignment with the new regulations which permit meetings to be held by remote means will be live streamed for public to view. To make the meeting run as smoothly as possible, can I please ask that participants in the virtual meeting room leave your microphone on mute when you are not speaking. When you want to speak, please raise your hand to the camera. Only unmute when the chair indicates that you can. If you are participating by audio means only, which we haven't got anyone today doing that, the chair will liaise with you as appropriate. Public speakers are permitted and the meeting host will bring speakers into the virtual meeting room at the appropriate time. Once you have spoken for the allotted time, the host will then return you to the virtual public gallery. Members should all have received and have access to the agenda and supplementary reports. If you have not, please can you indicate so during the members' in in introductions. Can everyone please ensure that all mobile phones and similar devices are switched to silent if at any time a member loses the ability ability to hear or be heard, they must alert the chair or host as soon as possible. Uh, members have key worker status, which has enabled them to carry out site visits if required. You may see members looking to the left and right of their screens. This is because they may be looking at an additional screen or device containing the agenda papers, not because they are distracted. As members and officers are mainly working from their own homes, you may hear distant sounds of children, pets or household noises from other rooms. At the end of each item, a vote will be taken by the committee and the applicant will receive a decision notice in the usual manner. I'll now hand over to the chair of the meeting. Thank you Thank very you, much. Do we have any apologies for absence? Yes, Chair, we have apologies for absence from uh, Councillor Jack Clarkson, um, Councillor Roger Davison and his sub will be Councillor Tim Huggan and from Peter Rippon and his sub will be Councillor Adam Hurst. Thank you very much. Um, any exclusion of the public or press? Thank you. Exclusion uh, no, of the public? No, nothing, it's okay. Uh, declarations of interest. Could some, any, okay, Councillor Sangar. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got two separate declarations of interest. So firstly, item 6D um, is a, I've got a disclosure of pecuniary interest as the site uh, is opposite my home. I will not be taking part in the discussion on the, or the decision on, on that item. Uh, in terms of item 6E, um, I have a personal interest as, as a forward councillor. Um, I, I have been contacted by residents, but I've not expressed any, any opinions um, and I'm free to, to take part in the determination. Thanks, Thank Chair. you. Thank you very much. Any more declarations of interest? No? Okay. I have a declaration of interest on item 6G. Um, in the interest of no bias, I will be not chairing this item or taking part in the debate due to the fact that I own a beauty salon in Broomhill. Okay. 
So when we get to that item, we will be following the procedure which is appropriate. Um, I also believe that a number of us have received representations which have been emailed to us. I just want to say that I pass those on to the case officer and I presume other members of the committee have done the same. Thank you. Okay, and then item five was the site visit. This did take place. Many members, um, to inform members that are, uh, members of the public that are watching, a lot of uh, members do make their own way to the site visits, which is why we don't do a report anymore. But um, we did actually go out yesterday. There are no minutes of the meeting. They will be on the, from the last week, last month, they will be on the next one. Okay, we'll now move to the main part of the agenda, which is item six. And I will introduce, I'm going to introduce item 6A and 6B together, but we will be voting on these separately. Okay, so a bit of a mouthful when we go through. So I'm going to introduce them both before we start. Item 6A, application number 20-014. 37 stroke RC3. Sorry. Okay. The proposal is the retention and refurbishment of existing buildings, demolition of associated structures, and erection of new buildings to form a mixed use development comprising a communal hall with associated retail space, cafe, bar, use classes A1, A2, A3, A4, A5 flexible business, events and studio space, uses class B1, D1, D2 and associated works. The location is a land bound by Cambridge Street, Wellington Street and Backfield, Sheffield S1, 4HP. Item 6B, application number 20, stroke 01438, stroke LB, CRG3. List of building consent by the council. The proposal is the retention and refurbishment of existing buildings, demolition of associated structures and erection of new buildings to form a mixed use development comprising a communal hall with associated retail space, cafe bar uses, classes A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, flexible business event and studio space uses classes B1, D1, and D2 and associated works. The location land found by Cambridge Street, Wellington Street and Backfield, Sheffield S1 for HD. And the officer on both of these is Howard Baxter. I hand over to Howard to do the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, if we could go down to uh, the first slide, we're gonna run through some um, slides of the scheme. So this shows the application site. Most members will be familiar with this. It's at the junction of Cambridge Street and Wellington Street and opposite the John Lewis building. Uh, next one, please. Um, this one shows some images uh, from the street. This is Cambridge Street, that's Henry's there. The buildings you can see in that photograph are part of the scheme and the ones below are on the Wellington Street frontage. Next one. Uh, this is a view from the rear of the site, uh, backfields, and you've got the HSBC building to the right, um, which has recently been completed. Next one, please. This just shows a little bit more context for the site. Uh, the site, it, all of it is in the conservation area. The boundary of the conservation area runs along Backfields and along Wellington Street. Um, immediately to the north of the site, there is the listed uh, Grade 2 Star Le Lears Yard. To the northwest of the site, there is the listed Grade 2 Math St Matthew's Church. And uh, obviously to the south of the site is the HSBC um, building and to the east, the uh, John Lewis building. Next slide, please. So these next few um, slides, they actually show, next four slides show the buildings that, uh, that are to be de demolished. 
Um, they're shown in red on that on the plan and um, on the elevations as well. Uh, so as you can see from that, that's Cambridge Street. Um, the wall on the right, which is uh, Albert, uh, former Albert Works, that's to be demolished. The shop front in what, what was um, uh, John Lewis used at one time is to be demolished. And the roof is to be replaced on the um, Henry's building on the corner. Next one, please. This is Wellington Street, and that's showing again the, the Henry's roof being replaced there. Next one, please. And uh, this is the top one is um, a view of the um just let me check on that yeah it's um a view of the chapel uh the bethel chapel and the bottom one is showing the um sunday school uh with the rear extension at the back being demolished next one please this is a, a proposed plan of the development uh the, the ones in pink on there, the units in pink, they are food and drink units or leisure units or community use units. And the ones in blue are retail or food and drink units. You'll see from that plan, uh, which is the uh, low ground floor plan, that there are lots of accesses into individual buildings from the street. Uh, both Cambridge Street, Wellington Street, and also the new public realm on the left-hand side of the site, which is um, new backfields. Next, uh, so this is the next level up, and this uh, plan shows the central pink area is the new communal hall, um, which, and it, it also shows the new public realm. So on the north of the site, you've got a new street to be created through a pedestrianised street called Albert Walk. And then just in the northwest corner, there is a new square to be created, which is called Linley Square. And that's got units overlooking it from, uh, from the new communal hall and from the rear of Bethel Chapel. And then on the west side of the site is a new public realm and pedestrian link down to Wellington Street. Next slide please. This shows the proposed elevation from Cambridge Street. Uh, the buildings in the foreground are the existing ones which uh, are largely being retained. The one in the middle there with the three-story uh, the that one, yes, that one is the listed um, Bethel Sunday School. And the coloured buildings at the back, the yellow one, that is the new development, which is uh, behind uh, the frontage buildings. Next one, please. This is showing the view from Wellington Street. Again, you've got the existing buildings in the foreground, which are largely being retained and refurbished. And then you've got the two gable ends of the new development. And in between is a um, modern interpretation of um, a food hall with a, um, a, a, a similar type of roof to that. Next one, please. Uh, this is the view from Backfields with the more contemporary new development shown here which is uh, to be faced in uh, weathered uh, metal and perforated uh, cladding um, with the existing buildings retained either side of it. Uh, you can see the rear of the Bethel uh, Chapel on the left and the Wellington Street buildings on the right. Next one, please. Uh, this one is showing the view facing north towards the Linley Square with the new development where the cursor is and the, the left is the, um, uh, the um, 
chapel, the Bethel Chapel elevation. Next one, please. This is a new elevation being created to the rear of the Bethel Chapel to face on to Linley Square. It's currently a blank elevation, a blank wall, and there's, uh, as you can see, a number of new windows with opening doors uh, being introduced so that they'll be uh, able to look out over the new Linley Square and access onto it. Next one, please. Uh, this one shows the uh, public, the pu new public realm in schematic form. Um, again, the north of the site is the Albert Walk. The square is in the northwest, and the link down to Wellington Street is um, on the west side of the site. Next one, please. So this is showing the development in a bit more wider context, so you can see it in relation to the existing buildings around the site. So the top image, the building in grey on the right of the new development, that is the HSBC offices. The building to the rear of the new development, which you can see over the top of it, that is John Lewis's. And the building immediately to the left of the site, uh, that is Leah's Yard. On the lower image, um, we have on the right hand side, we've got John Lewis's. We've then got the development. And then this is an outline of a current application, which hasn't been determined yet for an office development. And that is uh, block H2. Next slide, please. These are some 3D images of the scheme. You can see the existing buildings refurbished in the foreground, along with the new, more contemporary development at the back, coloured uh, sort of brown and grey. And then the lower image is an image from backfields uh, with the new development on the right and, an, uh, and the office scheme, which, as I said, hasn't been um, uh, determined yet on the left. Next image, please. These are a few images just to show you uh, the massing of the scheme shown in various viewpoints. And there are two um, rows of images there. The ones on the left of the 2015 scheme so that you can compare it with the current scheme, which is on the right. So the current scheme is the bit in gray and uh, sort of purple or pink. Uh, the blue element in there is the office building, which is not part of this application. So as you can see with the aerial view on the top, uh, the only building that was left standing in the 2005 scheme was a list of building in the middle. Uh, on the present scheme on the right, you can see the elevations uh, of both Wellington Street and uh, Cambridge Street retained with the new development in pink behind it. Um, the view up Wellington Street, the next one down, shows the uh, 2015 scheme in the um, pink, and then the current scheme on the right with the gray of the existing building and the purple of the new part of the development shown above it. Um, the views below are from Burgess Street, where again, you can see the same thing. And also the bottom view is not relevant because that's of the new office building. You want to go down to the final slide again these are a few other images of the scheme the top one's from cambridge street uh, the bottom one is also from the lower part of cambridge street um oh sorry the middle one lower part of cambridge street and i think the other one is from cross Burgess street um so that is the uh scheme. So the only th the only other thing I'd like to just draw members attention to is um, item three on the supplementary agenda. Um, there is a point of clarification first. 
which is that on page 37 of the committee agenda, um, that describes the heritage policy considerations for this application. One of those considerations is um, section 66 of the Planning and List of Building and Conservation Areas Act 1990, which sets out a duty to the local planning authority to have special regard to the desirability of preserving listed buildings or their settings or any features of special architectural interest which they possess. And that section 72 of the same uh, act also requires the local planning authority um, to give special attention to conservation areas, to the desirability of preserving or enhancing the character or appearance of that area. Well, both those are relevant because obviously we've got list of buildings and conservation area here. The assessment makes clear that there are some limited negative impacts on the character and setting of the list of buildings and conservation area but that these are significantly outweighed by the benefits of the proposal. It's clarified, well, just to clarify, in the conclusion on page 54, um, the penultimate paragraph makes it clear that in considering and, and producing this assessment, officers have considered the duty under section 66 and section 72 um, and we have concluded that the scheme will enhance the conservation area and preserve the character and setting of the list of buildings uh, when considered as a whole. And the final point to draw to members' attention is a replacement condition 30. So condition 30 uh, was concerned with a um, cutlass date stone which sits in the uh, front elevation of the Albert Works facade, uh, which is to be demolished. And this condition says that a scheme for its restoration shall be submitted, uh, restoration and relocation in the scheme. Um, and the condition has been amended to add in a potential second um, Cutler's date stone, which may be in the Henry's building, um, but isn't known uh, whether it is or not at the moment. But the building recording scheme, which is separate condition, will investigate that. So if one is discovered, then it will it will this um, scheme for restoration and relocation will apply. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Have you anything to add on item 6B or have you covered that? Because we're going to cover those together. Yeah, there's nothing to add on item 6 uh, other than the, the same points of clarification about the list of building uh, uh, section 62 apply, uh, six, six apply. Lovely. I just wanted to make sure before we move on to speakers, but thank you and welcome Mark, Helen. <laughs> Appreciate it. Right, we just have the one speaker on uh, this on this application, and that is speaking um, for, and that is Robin Hughes. Jay, could you bring Robin into the meeting, please? Welcome, Robin. <laughs> Hello, nice Jane. Thanks you. very much for having me. You're more than welcome. You've got five. Oh, I better get my timer on. You've got five minutes. OK. OK, Thank thanks you. very much. So um, Cambridge Street was once Culpit Lane, the ancient route in and out of the town of Sheffield to the south. It was the centre of the trade in materials for knife handles. Lear's Yard, which is out of scope of today's application, actually started life as the Culpit Lane Hornworks. And bone fragments are often found when digging the street surface. So the buildings you've seen tell 130 years of Sheffield's history. Uh, cities will prosper if they understand the economics of uniqueness and it's the individual character of a place with its own story to tell that is going to bring new residents, visitors, students and of course investors. Now for much of the last 20 years the proposal for this area has actually been to forget that story 
and tear down the buildings. But now, today, they are seen, I'm delighted to say, as assets to be repurposed, which is why I'm speaking in support of this application. That's largely down to the foresight of one particular council officer who worked with heritage volunteers to understand what this historic corner has to offer. But he has been supported by able partners and backed by this council. So I'd like to say it's been a privilege to work with all those involved. The old and will be joined by a new and distinctive development. My personal view is the proposed communal hall has the potential to become as dramatic and well-loved a space as the Winter Garden. Together, they'll make Sheffield a still more desirable destination that stands apart from the rest. Now, I shall be sorry to lose the last surviving fragment of Albert Works, which was built in 1891. And uh, before then, a matter we've already touched on, the mysterious undated stone bearing the cutler's arms and the initials LJS. That was before that date on, for several decades on Lindley's sheep shear works on the same site. And it's probably been more or less in, in the same position for about 300 years. So it's only right that there's a condition to preserve it there. The new walkway will secure access to Lear's Yard and the Sportsman. So there are compensations. And those two buildings do actually belong together. They were extensively redeveloped in 1863 to create the site in its present form, although, again, that's out of scope. We do get to keep the Bethel Primitive Methodist Chapel of 1835, built in what I'm going to call a heroic act of faith and determination by a small and poor congregation who saved money by doing much of the demolition and brick dressing themselves. Uh, their Sunday school attendance reached 500 within a year or so, so they had to build a new one next door. Um, both buildings will be given new lives thanks to this development. Something will survive of Diner, probably the oldest building that survives in the street, uh, dated 1837 or possibly earlier. Um, premises of William Wilde, dealer in ivory, shell, horn, tip, bone, stag and so on. So that's more evidence of the handle trade. New purposes are going to be found for the fine industrial buildings on Wellington Street. That's also good news. And the splendid facade we now know as Henry's. Um, what we see today was built in the early 1900s as the new Barleycorn Tavern. And in the 1920s, the landlord of that tavern was Gus Platts, British and European middleweight boxing champion. An incident took place there in 1924 involving the notorious Sheffield gangs, which led to Platts giving evidence at the trial of one of their members and subsequently warning members of both gangs to stay away, he being probably one of very few people in Sheffield at the time or even since who would have felt able to do so. Um, and I don't need my last paragraph. I was going to make a request regarding the possible date stone in Henry's, which was found in 1901, reported as to be relocated to the Cutler's Hall in 27, but in 1932 said still to be in the bar passage wall at the barley corn. And the Cutler's don't have it, I have asked them. So we don't know where it is, but uh, Howard's very ably amended the condition relating to the date stone. Um, so I have nothing more to do than simply welcome this project and uh, wish it bon voyage. Thank you. Thank you. And I found that really fascinating. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. And thank you for your kind comments. I'll pass over to Howard to respond to so, and thank you, Robin, and uh, you may okay. remove Robin from the meeting now, Jay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. I don't think there's anything there for me to respond to. Uh, they were all positive comments, um, which are in support of the recommendation. Thank you. Okay, so I shall open up to questions from members. Does anybody wish to ask any questions? No, any comments? Councillor Price. Just to, to welcome it, Chair. I think it's an exciting development. We've managed to save quite a bit of the heritage stuff that's in there, and it's bringing the whole, the whole city back up to modern, modern day standards, that bit of it. I think it's um, when everybody's decrying city centres, I think it's the ideal solution to, 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 to modern cities. I think the more people are beginning to live in our city centre now with the number of apartments, and this adds to that. And I think it's all very positive. And I think we we'll have to congratulate the officers and all the work they put in on this, oh. particularly to preserve the, the heritage side of it and the listed building side of it. And I think it's, I look forward to it. I think it's going to be great. Thank you. Anybody else, any comments? Yeah, uh, Councillor Garbutt. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, I, I welcome this because it's um, uh, it's it's very uh, sympathetic to um, what's gone before, to the history of the area. Um, 
and, and I'd like to see that uh, um, copied and, and emulated throughout the city um, in, in other schemes. Um, I am a little concerned about the uh, the viability in terms of what happens about COVID. This is a big, it's supposed to be a, a hall where a lot of people congregate. So it does concern me a little bit, but I think we have to look beyond, we have to look beyond that and, and see about, um, uh, you know, making this a, a, a much more um, uh, viable and vibrant place. And I think this may well be part of the solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, yeah. Well, I'd just like to say um, I absolutely welcome this and I think it's absolutely brilliant when you see how we've, um, the council officers and the council and the administration are working with the groups and to hear somebody come and speak like that and about the heritage and I learned so much and especially, you know, I just want to mention John Lewis, John Lewis Stain, we've seen what's happening in Birmingham they're not I think that shows the confidence in how we're moving the city forward and I just think it's really exciting and I welcome it and thank you to the council officers for all your hard work so I think we'll go along to the vote and okay we're going to take it in two parts so we're going to vote on item 6a first and the proposal is to grant conditionally okay so the first person, okay, Councillor Diane Hurst. Porter. Councillor Andrew Sangar. Or. Councillor Adam Hurst. Or. Councillor Alan Law. Councillor Law. Okay. Councillor Tony Downs. Or. Councillor Peter Garbutt. Four, Chair. Councillor Peter Price. Four. Councillor Bob McCann. Four. Councillor Zahira Nas. Four, Chair. Councillor Chris Rosling Josephs. Four, Chair. Councillor Tim Huggan. Four, Chair. Okay. So Abby, could you just come back? I don't think we can attract Councillor Law's attention, so we'll go to the vote without him. Right, uh, uh, that's uh, unanimous. Lovely. Uh, okay. I was trying to speak. I don't know whether it's back. Isn't, <laughs> he's on the I phone. don't think he's on the telephone. I believe. Yeah. Can we? Well, would it's? We'll just have to. Uh, We'll, we'll deal with that afterwards. So that's passed unanimously. Okay, so we'll now go on to item 6B and we'll go to the vote on, on this application. The recommendation is to grant conditionally. Okay, so we'll start again. Councillor Diane Hurst. Four, Chair. Councillor Andrew Sangar. Four, Chair. Councillor Adam Hurst. Four, Chair. Councillor Alan Law. Four, Chair. Councillor Tony Dams. Four, Chair. Councillor Peter Garbutt. Four, Chair. Councillor Peter Price. Four. Councillor Bob McCann. Four. Councillor Chris Rosling Josephs. Four, Chair. Councillor Tim Huggan. Four, Chair. And I, Abby, that is unanimous, isn't it, to grant conditionally? Yeah, can I? Thank you. Okay, lovely. So we'll move on to Sorry, items. Yeah. Sorry? Sorry, did we get Councillor Nas? Councillor Zahira Nas. So sorry, Zahira. Okay. <laughs> How can I missed you off? <laughs> that makes it unanimous. Thank you. Chair. Oh, you're not. I do apologise, Councillor Nas. Okay. <laughs> right, so we'll move on to item 6C. This is on, okay, this is application number 20 stroke 01301 stroke is outward planning permission. Is the application is for a proposal is for a hybrid application for change of use of existing buildings to be retained 
altered vehicular access from Loxley Road with secondary public transport access from Rowell Lane and associated works with outline approval with all other matters reserved, the demolition of existing buildings and structures, provision of a residential-led mixed-use development that will deliver up to 300 dwellings, reinstatement works, site remediation, green infrastructures, landscaping and associated infrastructure, amended description. The local, the location is Hepworth Properties Limited, East Works, Stores Bridge Lane, Shepherd S6, 6SX. And the officer presenting is Diane Holgate. Diane, if you'd like to present, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to show my screen. Lovely. Can you see the presentation? We can, yeah, you could go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. So the first slide, um, the application is a hybrid application, as we've explained. So part of it is in full, which is for the access and for the retention of some buildings and their reuse. The remainder of the application is for outline planning approval. So this um, slide just denotes the application boundary. And again, at Loxley Road up here, Storesbridge Lane and Rowell Lane here. This slide shows the extent of the applicant's ownership, which is the blue, and the application site boundary, which is in red. This slide shows an illustrative master plan um, for the areas that are in outline. So we have Yorkshire Waters Treatment Plant here. We have the retained buildings here, here, and down here. This slide shows the demolition um, of the structures that are to be, um, to be removed and also these buildings in yellow again, which are to be retained and reused. This plan shows the land use plan. So the woodland is shown in green, the river blocks are running through the site in blue and the proposed indicative residential areas um, in the buff color. This plan shows the um, potential um, building heights for um, the scheme. Um, the design and access statement has gone through indicative proposals to assess the likely building heights. So the pale blue is um, up to three storeys, which could be around nine metres, with the purple potentially due to land levels and topography being able to accommodate higher up to four storeys. This slide shows um, the existing buildings, which are in black, along with the proposed indicative layout that could wrapping around them. This um, plan shows the hard standing areas. There are a number of hard standings around the site, around the buildings, and also overlaid is the proposed layout. This slide shows um, some of the existing buildings that are to be demolished and to be retained. The brick structures, this is a row of um, terrace properties which are in residential use, and these buildings um, are to be retained for other uses. We've got a number of um, photographs um, taken from the um, visual impact assessment. They're not all the um, images, but a selection to give members an idea. So this is the view taken from Storesbridge Lane, which is the access here with the footpath, narrow footpath on both sides and trees either side. And again, the view within the site to the existing buildings. Again, some more views from the public footpaths that run through the site and the existing buildings. And again, a few more views. This view is taken from Rowell Lane. And again, a few more images, the um, residential properties again, and the views from Loxley Road, which show um, Yorkshire Water site, the woodland, existing buildings, and the western edge of Sheffield. Again, um, some more views. This is taken from Mouse Lane, looking south towards the site. And these views are taken from the footpath, which are taken from Loxley Road. And some more views with the Yorkshire Water Treatment Plant here and existing buildings. 
that's the um, images. Um, the application is recommended for refusal on the basis of its impact on the green belt, that it is, um, would have a greater impact on the green belt than the existing development. Um, there's um, a number of technical matters that haven't been addressed, so they form a reason for refusal also, and also the fact that the exception test for flooding has also not been passed. Um, I'd like to draw your attention, councillors, to a um, brief um, supplementary information. Yorkshire Water have confirmed with us that they have no objections subject to conditions. However, um, the existing sewerage system can only accommodate up to 50 properties, so there would need to be upgrades if um, for more than that. And also um, the Woodland Trust have confirmed that they have um, no comments to make um, in, in respect of the ancient woodland and the trees. That's Thank it. you. Thank you, Diane. Right, we have a number of speakers. Jay, if you could bring in, we have some number of speakers against. So starting with Councillor Penny Baker, if you could bring Penny into the meeting, please. I can I can't see you, Penny, yet. <laughs> Lovely. Welcome, welcome to planning. Right, um, you have five minutes, Penny, if you could start, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. I speak not only for myself, but for my colleague councillors and many constituents that put their, uh, their opinions through to us that we have all obviously forwarded on to planning. We felt it was better if one of us did to leave more time for others to discuss. So thank you, Chair. The area we're talking about is a beautiful isolated area at the edge of a peak district. There is no supporting infrastructure, no doctors, no schools, no shops. Um, and the access to the site itself, as you said, through Rowell and Storesbridge Road, are quite rural and long, quite long to get any, to any main road. So it's not the sort of road that you'd want your teenagers walking on to walk home at night from the main road. Mm -hmm. So it would mean that car usage would be, in actual fact, necessary to live on that site, which may, would bring there again impacts back onto the Mailing Bridge Drive Raceway, which is already struggling very much from that area. I, I, I'd like to, through you, Chair, support the uh, submission from the Friends of Loxley Valley who have um, done a really good job of informing local residents of what has been happening. And um, the officer's report itself, which I think went into uh, a lot of the details that was concerning us. So I'll keep it short, Chair, and say um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak, and I would like to support the officer's um, suggestions. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Thank you for your brevity, I appreciate it. Okay, if we could remove Councillor Baker and bring Nikki Rivers in, please, Jay. Welcome, Dr. Rivers. If you'd like to start, you've got five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of Sheffield and Rotherham Wildlife Trust, this is a summary of the key points we've made in our more detailed submission. We support the planning officer and also ask you to refuse this application for the following reasons. Number one, outline permission means that critical details are not included. Now, it'll leave too much to reserve matters, as has been highlighted by the case officer and all the way through the report. For an application in this sensitive site, there's a high risk that any house builder that comes on board wants to change various aspects of the application, including the illustrative master plan and layout, and therefore undermine any agreements to avoid, mitigate, and enhance biodiversity on this important site. Number two, there's insufficient assessments of local wildlife sites. The development would be partly within local wildlife sites number 108 and there's no mention at all made of 
the Kowala site number 111, which is only 10 metres away. No maps provided showing the boundaries and there's no description of the features of the local wildlife site and the conditions of the habitat that may be impacted, lost or gained. There is potential here to bring that wildlife site 108 into positive conservation management, but the details have not yet been supplied to be confident that this would happen. So if approved, there's a risk of being in breach of uh, council policy GE13, which is designed to protect and enhance local wildlife sites and the application should therefore be refused. Next point is that the site also lies in the strategic green network and policy um, core strategy policy 73 states that within and close to urban areas, the strategic green network will be maintained and enhanced where possible. But the application does not demonstrate sufficiently how this will happen. For example, we agree with the ecology unit that proposed eight metre wide buffer around the river is inadequate to protect the habitat and species they support from too much disturbance. Therefore, the application should be refused. Next point is woodland and other priority habitats. We agree with Sheffield Council that woodland survey is inadequate and details of tree removal are not clear enough. Details of how woodland will be protected, enhanced are also lacking and any infrastructure be informed by an ecologist. The river corridor and mill ponds are being identified as habitats of principal importance, covered by section 41 of the Net Biodiversity Duty, but they've not been adequately assessed and details of proposed monitoring management of priority habitats is also lacking. So it's our view the applicant has not fully demonstrated compliance with net biodiversity duty and its associated habitats and species and therefore a decision based on this information be unsound should be refused. Likewise we think there's an adequate survey and assessment of protected species on the site. We agree with the ecology unit that the, there's, the, there's not sufficient survey of bats, birds and other protected species have not been carried out and we went into further details in submission. The site is known to be of district level importance to bats and we disagree with the consultant's conclusions about the impacts on bats because the surveys were inadequate. The bird surveys were out of date and did not include um, kingfisher which is a protected species on the site. The were surveys for barn owl which is another protected species but the proposed mitigation is not detailed enough and you can't condition protect species surveys, so the application should be refused. We support the case officer's conclusion that biodiversity net gain assessment should be included as part of this application. That's also currently lacking and cannot be conditioned. So finally, there's no reference in the application to the Sheffield Lakeland Landscape Partnership Landscape Conservation Action Plan, which includes a number of up-to-date landscape character maps of this area, which were compiled in partnership with the Peak District National Park Authority, this needs to be addressed. So we focus on the ecological concern this summer is other interested parties will be covering concerns around the setting, green belt sustainability. We've also covered those concerns in our submission. We just want to finish by saying we're in the middle of both climate and ecological emergencies, so we cannot see how this application would address the twin needs for carbon reduction and contribute to nature's recovery. We're also disappointed with the community engagement, which started promisingly, but then tailed off into this rushed application and that's reflected in the approximately 900 ob objections from the community to this proposal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Right. If we could remove, that's brilliant. Could we bring um, Catherine McKay in please next? Welcome, Catherine. Good afternoon, Chairman, and good afternoon, everybody else. Lovely. You've got five minutes, Catherine. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a photograph. Can you see me? I can see you. I can see your husband as well. <laughs> oh, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're much nicer than he is. Get him out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, yes. Well, my name is Kath Mackay, and I represent then the Friends of Loxley Valley mm -hmm. um, and I wish to support the officer's recommendation for refusal of this application. We are a community group of 111 members but many of them joined us after the current planning application was received and this I think along with the 900 objections indicates the strength of local opposition. The rural tranquility of the valley, its wildlife, its attractive landscape are valuable assets for the people who live within it, 
or use it for recreation on a regular basis. And these aspects of community life, as well as the local fragile biodiversity, are under threat from an insensitive proposal like this. There was widespread dismay, as Nikki has just said, uh, in the applicant's community consultation. It was not in accordance with the suggestions which were made at the 2018 stakeholder meeting. Our first concern is the lack of information. Um, again, the outline permission we considered to be totally inappropriate, and the report recognises that. Um, Nikki has already explained our same feelings, so I won't go into that particular point. But we do believe that much of the support for the scheme lay in the expectation of affordable housing. And past experience suggests that house builders will try to avoid such commitment. And there was insufficient information about the affordable housing, which has been recognised in the case officer's report. Our second concern um, is that landscape and the green belt are crucial to the people who live around here. The case officer agrees with us that the Loxley Valley's green belt status is of major importance. The effect on openness, detrimental visual impact, and its being an inappropriate development are given as reasons for refusal. And our argument that much of the site has now blended into the landscape with positive results has been acknowledged. The valley's landscape is treasured by the local community, its varied undulating topography dotted with small villages, copses and fields penetrates into the high moorlands in a stunning way with beautiful views of the Derwent skyline and an ever-widening ever sweep of the land. It acts as a perfect green corridor from the city into the National Park. There is no justification for introducing a major development into this setting when the land will need modifying in order to accommodate it, the development site is not included in the council's brownfield register and Sheffield has met its five year res reserve housing land requirement. Thirdly, it is an unsustainable proposal. The case officer's report describes it as far from sustainable, thus supporting local residents' contention that existing facilities and services in Stannington are not reasonably accessible from this site. It is isolated and the topography means that the private car is the only re reasonable travel option. All the feasible routes into Stannington are uphill, 110 metres, and it is unrealistic to expect school children or adults doing their shopping or anyone visiting the doctor to walk or cycle up a winding narrow country lane with no footway or to use a rough unmade potentially muddy path. And a large housing estate would add extra pressure to schools and medical services, which would prevent them from readily being absorbed into the existing community. And we firmly believe that there will be severe cumulative impact on the highway network. There is welcome recognition that the impact on the public rights of way network has not been fully addressed. This is of major importance to the large number of walkers, cyclists and horse riders who use the valley for recreation. Our quiet country lanes and bridleways could easily become increasingly hazardous. And we Got have 30 no seconds doubt, left, Catherine. Thank you. That precious routes would not be lost. The Friends of Loxley Valley agree with the case officer's four main reasons for rejecting the proposal. And we strongly urge you to refuse the application. Thank you. Thank you, and I apologise for mispronouncing your surname. <laughs> That's okay, everybody does it. <laughs> Lovely. Uh, okay, thank you. Could we bring Andy Tickle in, please? Hmm. Welcome, Andy. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. You have five minutes. <laughs> My name is Andy Tickle, and I'm speaking on behalf of CPRE, the countryside charity. CPRE very much welcome the council's detailed report on the proposal for 300 new dwellings in the Loxley Valley. We thank council officers for the substantial assessment involved in ensuring all the complex material planning considerations have been identified and explored in depth. 
The proposed development flies in the face of the city's ambition to protect and enhance its precious countryside and the green belt and deliver its housing requirements sustainably in the urban area, properly supported by the infrastructure necessary for sustainable living. Refusal is the only reasonable conclusion and the only way not to undermine the city's emerging plan currently out for statutory consultation. The development of 300 new dwellings in the tranquil, beautiful and biodiverse Loxley Valley is highly unsustainable, highly reliant on greater use of the car, highly damaging to the openness and rural quality of this valley where it rises into the Peak District and is simply not needed to meet the city's housing requirements. The Council's assessment of the proposals is strongly evidence-based and takes into account both national and local planning policy. It balances the relevant and sometimes competing planning considerations with care, insight and fairness. The case for refusal is strong, fully justified and defensible. So we fully endorse the report and recommendation, but we also think the case for planning harm is underestimated in two main areas and that the reasons for refusal can be stronger. Firstly, we say that the applicant's landscape and visual impact assessment and the officer's report underestimates the impact on the openness of the green belt. Harm to openness accrues not just due to the existing development having blended into the landscape, which is your first reason for refusal, but also because the development proposes building on prominent and undeveloped parts of the site and building more densely or higher than the existing buildings when viewed from both outside and inside the site, for example, on the many rights of way. Protecting openness within the site is a legitimate planning consideration. Secondly, while we agree with your planning officer's views on the locational barriers to accessibility, we consider that the situation in reality is much worse. And I, I won't say what I was going to say because uh, Kath from the Friends of the Loxley Valley has just said how difficult it is to get anywhere. For this reason, we consider that prospective purchasers of houses would inevitably assume that use of the car was inevitable um, for day-to-day -day access to schools and services and would only move in if they had access to multiple cars and were willing to adopt a car reliant lifestyle. The development is therefore even less sustainable than stated. It's therefore inconsistent with paragraph 110 of the National Planning Policy Framework, which requires all new development to prioritize active travel first, which is walking or cycling, then public transport second. It is also inconsistent with paragraph 148 of the framework, which requires the planning system to shape places in ways that contribute to radical reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, minimize vulnerability and improve resilience. This applies not only to the car dependency issue, but also the lack of deliverable sustainable measures commensurate with the climate emergency and Sheffield's target to be carbon zero by 2030. We therefore ask you to refuse this application and thank you for listening. Thank you very much and thank you for keeping it short. Okay, um, the next person we I have down is a David Holmes. Good afternoon. Welcome, David. Um, if you're ready, you can start. You have five minutes. Thank you. Well, my name is David Holmes, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Loxley Valley Design Group. Uh, I was one of the design group team who produced the Loxley Valley Design Statement. The statement is a community vision for this special valley that links our city to a wild and beautiful corner of the Peak District National Park. It's a sort of local plan in microcosm for the Loxley Valley, if you like. It supplements the planning policies of the City Council and the National Park Authority. And page 106 of your officer's report refers to the design statement. Members, at the heart of today's decision is the impact this application must have on sensitive Greenbelt countryside that local people cherish. 
And the design statement gives voice to local people's views. It refers to the sense of spaciousness that we feel here. And this spaciousness, this retreat, this closeness to nature had never been more important than this year when more people than ever need refuge on their doorsteps from the worries of COVID and the crises of climate emergency and bio depletion. The design statement includes landscape guidelines that the city council has adopted as supplementary planning guidance. And these say that development shouldn't damage important views into the valley and shouldn't harm natural features of value. We fear, we fear this application would substantially damage views and openness and as your officers have said, would potentially harm natural features on land that has now blended back into the landscape and isn't previously developed. Local people are not rosy eyed. We know the old factory site needs cleaning up sometime. The design statement devotes a page to it. It describes it as a festering industrial eyesore needing a solution of outstanding environmental sensitivity. When the applicants bought the site and invited us to an exploratory workshop almost two years ago, we hoped such a solution might be within reach. Your then chief planning officer spoke of an open-minded exploration of whether there might be a sustainable solution and hoped this would lead to a full detailed planning application of award-winning status. Unfortunately, as we've said in our written objection, that didn't happen. You now have before you an outline application that begs more questions than it answers. As many hundreds of our friends and neighbours have said in their objections, the community wants a solution, but not redevelopment that creates more problems than it solves. Ironically, since we wrote about a festering eyesore, the site has largely gone to sleep and returned to nature. It's now difficult even to see from above because it's largely screened by trees. Recently, I stood down there in darkness, peace and tranquility, and watched bats flying across the Loxley Old Wheel Town. Yes, the factory buildings may be ugly, they may offend the human aesthetic, but they host thriving ecosystems and biodiversity that would be at risk from mass housing and 24 hour human presence. I'll quote two key phrases from your officer's conclusion. On page 120, they say there are no significant benefits in terms of remediation that are imminently required in relation to potential pollution or wildlife. Remediation measures are only required in connection with the development of the land for housing. On page 123, they say there is no evidence to suggest the sites currently posing an imminent risk to the environment or the public. In other words, there is no urgent need to do anything down there. The city and the community have time to see definite solution. In summary, your officer's report sets out why this proposed development would be unsustainable and damaging. It also sets out deep reservations about just how damaging because the application is vague and lacks vital information. If you were to approve this application today, you would risk the unknown and risk urbanization of this vital gateway from the outdoor city to the National Park. This is a remarkable site and this is not what the city should be looking for. It's too important a strategic decision for the city to risk getting it wrong. And therefore, we would urge you to support your officer's recommendation and have faith that with determination, ambition, and a spirit of compromise, the city can achieve something better. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Thank you. If you could bring the next speaker in, please, uh, Robin Hughes again. <laughs> Welcome, Robin. <laughs> Hello again. Yeah, okay. You know the drill. <laughs> I, I do. Hi. Five minutes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. Uh, and I should just clarify that both for this and previous applications, I'm speaking on behalf of Hallamshire Historic Buildings. Um, so to the current application, Sheffield's river valleys and their historic infrastructure of dams, weirs and artificial channels are central to the city's identity. 
at the fast flowing rivers such as the Loxley and the ingenious ways in which they were put to use to power our industries have made the city's reputation and fame and they completely encapsulate the significance achieved by the city. They've shaped its people and its culture and they've led to a major contribution on the world stage. The Sheffield Waterways strategy, to which the council is a signatory, describes Sheffield's river valleys and their complex system of man-made infrastructure as a globally important place, worthy of UNESCO World Heritage status. The Loxley Valley is particularly rich in survivals of this water management infrastructure. But there's more. This particular spot, the Stannington Clay outcrops, which proved particularly suitable for Benjamin Huntsman's revolutionary crucible process, and such refractory products have been central to developing and producing the specialised metals and alloys that have made the world as we know it. Without Sheffield's contribution, the modern world would not be possible. The Loxley refractory industry is said to have supplied 95% of all hollow refractories produced in Great Britain in the 1930s. During the Second World War, steel making depended upon these to such an extent that the valley had its own anti-aircraft gun. The Loxley Valley was critical to the country's survival. This is more than purely local significance. The valley is defined as an area of special character, protected by policies B15 and 18 of the Unitary Development Plan, which prohibit harm to the character of such areas, require the retention of features that contribute to their character, and require applications to include sufficient information for an impact assessment. The water management infrastructure is also protected by policies GE16 and G17. The Loxley Valley Design Statement, to which David referred a few minutes ago, which is supplementary planning guidance, states in paragraph 2.1i that development should avoid interfering with the delicate historic patterns of drainage, water supply and spring stream flow. National Planning Policy Framework paragraph 190 places a duty on the local planning authority to identify and assess the significance of all heritage assets, and that's whether designated or not, and to avoid or minimise any conflict between the heritage assets conservation of any aspect of the proposal. Paragraph 189 then describes applicants to describe that significance so as to inform the consideration in 190. Sorry to say the heritage assessment offered by the applicant falls a long way below the standards set by BE18 and framework 189 despite its length. Mines and tramway remains are not acknowledged as heritage assets and in fact they're barely mentioned. Bizarrely a mine entrance is indicated as a site for a children's play area. The waterways interconnecting the river with the existing and former dams are dealt with in a cursory fashion. They're not acknowledged as heritage assets which they undoubtedly are. It's not possible to determine from the master plan how they will be treated. Buildings are treated in a somewhat arbitrary fashion. A historic bridge is dismissed as unsafe and its restoration is not considered. A chimney likely to be the only remains above ground in the stores, bridge, fire, brickworks, an obvious heritage asset and potential landmark feature is to be demolished, but no reason is given. And um, you'll probably gather from my tone that I'm tired of being told that the heritage of our great cities of purely local significance. Even the otherwise excellent and very well researched officers report falls prey to this, this common error. Uh, I've, as I've said earlier today, and I'll say again now, our heritage is full of compelling stories that everyone should know about, ranging from the personal to the global, and it's time we started shouting about them. This application merely skims the surface of the historic significance of the site, keeping a few tokens, but otherwise either dismissing it or failing to acknowledge it at all. And amongst all the many good reasons for refusal, for this reason alone, it should be refused. Thank you. And thank you very much, Robin. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right. We did have a Craig Gamble review, but apparently he can't make the meeting. So Abby is going to read his statement out. Abby, if you have five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this um, was sent in by Craig Gamble Pugh um, just before the committee um, and his statement reads as follows. Uh, I need to give my apologies due to childcare. I refer members to the detailed written objections submitted by Sheffield Climate Alliance. The outline proposal fails to meet the authority statement stated commitment to tackling the climate emergency. I've been working with the office of Olivia Blake MP surveying residents in Stannington Ward on issues of concern, local objections, um, to the issues raised, please reject this application today. Thank you, thank you, Abby. Thank you. We have one speaker in favour of the application, and it's uh, Lauren Nearly. If we could 
bring, bring, sorry, bring Lauren into the meeting. <laughs> Are we having problems, Jay? I'm requesting her to start a video, but I'm not sure. Oh, Lauren, are you there? Um, if you can hear me, you should be receiving a box that's asking you to start your video. If you can click accept on that box. Chair, I do have the statement if you, if you want me to read this out. I think, um, yeah, we have one last try. Well, I'll, I'll take her back out, bring her back in, see if I Yeah, well, this, we'll just do, ah, we've oh. got another, yeah. Right. Okay, let's try again. Lauren, can you hear us? Have we taken her out, Jay, and brought her back in, or has she just tried to get on again on another device? She's just tried, yeah. I'll... Okay, just take both of those out and bring one of them back in, and then, it, oh, then we need to probably have the statement read out instead. We've now got three. <laughs> Oh, the grace of modern technology chair. I know, it's okay. I'm being very calm. <laughs> it's testing me, isn't it? <laughs> right, she's connecting to audio now. Lauren, can you? Ah, welcome. You are, you are muted, Lauren. Hi, Jane, sorry. Oh, no, 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 don't worry. I enjoyed the breather. I've got quite an agenda. Welcome. You have five minutes, Lauren. Okay. Lauren, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am Maureen Maria Baveson Young, um, speaking on behalf of the applicant's agent. In formulating this application, we have sought to adopt a collaborative approach, working with officers as well as local stakeholders. What is clear from public feedback is that there is a legacy of mistrust in the area, which is due in part to actions of the site's previous owners. Despite this, there is well in excess of 200 representations of support. We have worked closely with a number of your officers over the course of the last two years. Initially, this was with Rob Merfin and more recently, Diane Holgate and Michael Johnson. We have held a number of design sessions with local stakeholders, a full public consultation exercise, as well as attending eight separate meetings with officers at the pre-application stage. We have also had scheduled weekly meetings with the case officer, both pre and post submission. It's therefore extremely disappointing and indeed prize has been brought to committee at this stage. I would just add that both Michael and Diane have acted extremely professionally in our dealing with them, which makes the fact that we've been cut short in our negotiations all the more disappointing. The committee report is comprehensive in that it deals with all the relevant considerations. However, we are in clear disagreement with the officers, um, matters which could have been worked through with more time. The following is just a summary of the key points I'd like to highlight in the time available. A key theme running throughout the officer's report and indeed the recommendations for refusal is the clear objection to the approach of submitting an outline application. It was, however, agreed in writing with officers at the outset of this process that an outline planning application would be acceptable, subject to the provision of detailed support and information. An appropriate scope of detailed support and information was therefore discussed and agreed with officers prior to submission and provided as part of the application. If officers were still unhappy, they could have requested that the application was amended, however, this did not happen. Questions have been raised 
sustainable the site is. The final scheme presents an opportunity to regenerate a local eyesore, which is subject to many ongoing local complaints. The site has been largely derelict for more than 20 years and the proposed scheme will transform it into an innovative and sustainable community. The plans comprise many sustainable measures, including, but not limited to, a proposed home working hub, community assets comprising potential bike hire, GP surgery, cafe, restaurants and workshop units, new and improved attractive walking and cycling routes, and protected and enhanced habitats, green infrastructure and open space. It is also agreed that the existing 52A bus service will be connected, um, extended directly into the application site, which would help connect the site to the city centre, reduce reliance on the private car and further enhance the site's sustainability. The proposals are therefore considered to be entirely sustainable. The existing buildings, infrastructure and hard standing that comprise the derelict remains of the former refractory classify the majority of the site as previously developed land. The planning application red line covers a wider area such as woodland, but we are not proposing to develop on these areas. The proposals are therefore policy compliant in that they satisfy policy which encourages the efficient use of brownfield land for housing development. We recognise that the land is within the green belt. The application therefore comprehensively demonstrates that the development would not have a greater impact on the openness of the green belt than the existing development in accordance with guidance in the MPPF. This is a matter of planning judgment. However, we have not been afforded the opportunity to have this discussion despite submission of further information recently requested by officers. The applicant, contrary, contrary to us report in the committee report, has also demonstrated compliance with the exception provided in the MPPF, which is set out in our support and information. The development would see the reuse of previously developed land and the applicant has committed to the full 10% affordable housing provision as identified by Sheffield City Council. The proposals would provide a mixture of high quality of homes, including elderly accommodation and self-built units that would contribute not only to the affordable housing needs in Sheffield, but to the immediate housing supply. In summary, we firmly believe the proposals would provide significant benefits to Sheffield and in particular the local area, including affordable housing, regeneration of a highly contaminated brownfield site, extensive new and protected green infrastructure, ecological enhancements and biodiversity gains, and protected and managed woodland. I would therefore ask members to consider this application in line with these points and the applicant's willingness and commitment to deliver a high quality development that would meet the council's requirements and aspirations for the site. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Could we move from Lauren, please? Lovely. We've got um, another one, an empty box there. OK. Lovely. OK, if I could hand back to Diane to um, respond to the comments made. Thank you, Chair. Lots of comments there from um, objectors, which we feel have been adequately addressed within um, the officer report. Um, taking account of the comments with regards to um, heritage and assessment of the buildings, um, South Yorkshire Archaeology did advise us that if we were to proceed with any recommendation for approval, then they would suggest conditions such as um, a proper scheme of investigation and also um, that heritage impact assessment would be undertaken and that was suggested by a condition if we were to proceed with an approval. Um, in terms of Lauren's um, comments um, in support, I think um, the application, um, yes, everybody agrees that this site does need developing at some point. Um, I'm not party to discussions that have been had in terms of what type of application in the past. The application is supported by a very good um, design and access statement, which um, you would expect for a site of this nature. But the issue is that um, all this is indicative and illustrative and the concerns from officers is that that might not be transpired into the final development and there is nervousness about you know the um, overall scheme that might be brought forward um, it's accepted that they've committed to the affordable housing but there's no detailed information for us to be able to weigh that in the balance so unfortunately um, with the 
amount of outstanding um, technical matters outdated ecology reports. Unfortunately, this has resulted in a recommendation for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. I shall open that now to members' questions. Have uh, any member wish to ask a question? Councillor Sangar, anyone else before? Okay, Councillor Sangar, your question, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. I mean, as I say, it's a, a very good report from the officers. I mean, I mean just t talk to me about, about flooding. I mean, I mean, this is an outlying planning permission. What, what would you expect the developers to have submitted in terms of flood prevention work for it to, to, to have passed paragraph 160 of the National Planning Policy Framework? Thank you, Councillor. Um, the application is accompanied by a flood risk assessment and a sequential test. So there are several parts to the assessment in terms of um, flooding. The site is um, affected by flood zones one, two and three. So that ranges from low to high. Um, it, the Environment Agency haven't raised any concerns and the applicant did discuss with the Environment Agency in detail before coming in with the application. And so there are no concerns um, from um, actually protecting um, the development for the lifetime in terms of protecting people and property. Um, the sequential test has been passed on the basis that our policy team have advised there are no other sites of this size that could deliver the development in a lower flood zone. So it's passed that part. Um, the part in which then it needs to move on to is the exception test. To pass the exception test, it needs to demonstrate that it delivers wider sustainability um, measures to the community. And it's on that basis when taking account of all the other issues raised within the report that it has not passed the exception test and it does not deliver the wider sustainability benefits that the community expects. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I say I'll, I'll come back and come back with comments later. Okay, I'll pop you down for a comment then, Councillor Sangar. Any more questions from any members? No, we'll move on to comments then. Could I just um, make a list of people that wish to make a comment? Okay, Councillor Hurst, Councillor Price, and Councillors, Councillor Bob McCann, yeah. Okay, can I just remind members, try not to repeat what everyone else has said when you make your comments. Okay, Councillor Sangar, again. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Chair. I mean, I mean, as a number of speakers have said, uh, Loxley Valley has got a special character. Um, we always knew that, that um, you know, this is a historic site, as, as has been, been said, um, and clearly we were expecting you know something to come in but this 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 application uh, doesn't do justice to the site um you, you know it, it would be see, seen it would be it would sit seen from all, all sorts of places so i think the officers have done a, a very good job and i'm very pleased to support the officers uh, recommend recommendation for, for refusal on this site thank you councillor hurst your comment please to unmute. Thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. I mean, it's a comment. I, th I suppose if I was asking questions of the, uh, the speaker in favour, it would be a question. There's two assertions in there that I had. Uh, it's some, comments, Councillor Hurst. I will be. I, I, the, the, the assert, but the, the comments I would have is um, the confidence that uh, was had that the 56 bus route will actually serve whatever's developed. I mean, I you frozen. There's a bus route and how sustainable it is, is uh, not that great. And the other thing is, how many times have we heard the promise of 10% delivery of uh, affordable housing? And then when it comes to it, it doesn't happen. So without something much more concrete on that, I would have reservations about this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Price. Thank you, Chair. Just to say, I fully support the officer's recommendation, Chair. I think the 300 dwelling is way over the top. It is the green belt, it's too big. However, I do think the site is a blot of the Loxley Valley. Last time I went to see those buildings, they are quite ugly. And indeed, I think quite dangerous if any youngsters get playing in them. So something needs to be done on that bit of the site. And I think in, sometime in the future, we will have to accept some housing on that site and, and get rid of that blot. But at the moment, this is way over the top, and I think the officer's recommendation is spot on, Chair. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bob McCann. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I'm always very wary about line planning permissions of this size because mm -hmm. inevitably what comes back to full planning permission sometimes there's very little resemblance to what we've actually agreed to. And given the sensitive nature of this area, I think if this had been a full planning permission, I might have a different view. But as it is, I fully support the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Any more comments from any members? No, I mean, uh, I echo the comments that everyone's made, you know, and it's good to see that the officer report is so thorough. And I'd like to thank the officers for that. And it shows the commitment towards the green belt and working with the community. Right then. So the officer recommendation is to refuse. Um, we will now go to the vote. And I won't forget you, Councillor Naz. <laughs> Councillor Diane Hurst. For the officer's recommendation. recommendation yeah. Councillor Sangal. Yeah, for the officer's recommendation. Councillor Hurst. Yes. Adam, <laughs> two Councillor Hurst. It's like Adam Hurst. <laughs> yeah, well, you see, you're always trying to shut up, aren't you? <laughs> right, no. yeah. it's, for, it's for the council, sorry, for the officer recommendation. Yeah. Councillor Law? For oh, Chair. Yeah. Councillor Dams? For the officer's recommendation, Chair. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Garbutt? For the officer's recommendation. Councillor Price? Again, for the officer's recommendation. Councillor McCann? For the officer's recommendation. Councillor Naz? For oh, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Rosling Josephs? For the officer recommendation, Chair. Councillor Hogan. For the officer recommendation, Chair. I make that unanimous, Abby. Are we correct? Okay, the application is we go with the officer recommendation to refuse. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So we're going to now go on to item 6D. And before this, uh, Councillor Sangar is going to leave. Jay, if we could put Councillor Sangar into the waiting room. That sounds awful, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll throw him out of the meeting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. So uh, uh, item 6D is application number 20-01702 stroke FUL. It's a full planning application and the proposal is the application under section 73 to vary condition 10, that's the hours of use restriction on an outside seating imposed by application 19 stroke 01727 FUL, which was a change of use of a retail shop use class A1 to a micro pub use class A4, including a retractable awning to shop front and provision of a seating area to allow outside seating area to be used between 11.30 and 2100 hours any day for 12 months amended description. The location is DH Boa on Sons for Brooklyn's Avenue, Sheffield S10 4GA and it's on page 125 of your agenda. Okay and the officer presenting is Dinah. If you could go ahead Dinah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to share the screen. Lovely. I'll let you make sure that we're... Yep, that's fine. Okay, okay so um, I'll just bring up a site plan. Uh, this is the uh, shopping area in the um, middle of Forward Village. And there's a, a plan of the site and a photograph. So this site comprises of a micro pub with four court seating uh, located in the forward shopping area. Condition 10 of their 2019 planning permission restricted use of the outdoor seating area to between 11.30 a.m. and 7 p.m. Following amendments to this application, the applicant, the applicant is now seeking to vary condition 10 to allow outdoor seating until 9 p.m. daily for a temporary period of 12 months. And 9 p.m. It's worth noting that 9 p.m. is in line with the government's temporary coronavirus pavement cafe scheme. Um, and uh, that's all I'd like to say, Chair. I'll stop sharing. 
Lovely, thank you very much. Okay, we just have one speaker on this application and it's in support and it's a James Eardley. It's Eardley. I hope I pronounced that right. I'm not doing very well today, Pat. Okay, Jay, could you bring him in, please? Welcome, James. I hope I pronounced your surname correctly. Probably. Right, there we go. I've been, I've been called worse. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm doing very well today. Okay. You have five minutes, James. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, mm -hmm. Nice to meet you all, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd just raise a couple of points that might be, you know, of, of additional interest to the, um, to the application. So, um, the, um, First point is um, about sort of the numbers that, that that can be seated outside. Um, obviously, COVID rules have changed recently to the new rule of six, which um, which in fairness makes it easier to manage numbers outside. Previously, members from six households could meet outside, so sort of managing and numbers as long as they weren't in groups of bigger than thirty um, made it difficult. So the the new COVID rules of the rule of six will make it easier to um, to limit the numbers outside. Having said that, although that's not good for business, <laughs> um, it also um, it sort of stresses the the need for extended hours um, out there to um, so you know customers aren't trying to sort of concentrate into a smaller time frame. It would be you know be uh, be better for for numbers if there was a, a larger time scale that they could uh, use the outside area. Um, I will um, moving on from that. Um, if, the, if it was granted till nine o'clock, then I'd ensure that um, last orders were at half eight. So the cust so customers have enough time to drink up and be cleared from the uh, site um, by the time um, it closes, the, the outside area closes. Um, I just wanted to sort of mention the, the, um, the temp, I, 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 I might delay things, but the, the temporariness of this, this application, I, I sort of I need to know more about it because my understanding is that the, the, I've already got temporary the temporary grant granted um due to the uh the pavement license that i've got the covid pavement license and according to the the, is it the local government association that potentially will be will be will be extended till september 2021 so i just sort of want to perhaps know a bit more or, or just be confident that that if it is granted on a temporary basis i'm not going to be in the same position in 12 months time because it is, it is quite stressful knowing you know being able to not plan the business accordingly because um i mean for example we're recruiting at the moment for a for a new member of staff um if we are allowed to have some extra uh, extra hours outside then it's it's making that sort of area a bit more uh you know weatherproof as installing some heaters so uh, customers don't just need to rely on the beer jackets uh, <laughs> to keep them warm um so yeah it's just you know what you know if, if if it is a temporary basis reviewed in september next year what constitutes a complaint you know and, and you know I, you know just yeah um it'd be, it'd be from my point of view it'd be much better if it was a permanent thing you know it'd be a lot easier for you guys to to still to to reverse the decision even if it was a permanent thing um but yeah i just wanted to sort of find out a bit more about that um the um quickly quickly i want to address some of the um the 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 comments that are right that the rose and the objections just quickly go through um so we have been operating since lockdown ended uh, for 10 weeks of what's been a fairly fairly nice um weather you know been fairly nice weather wise for england which has been all right um and as far as i'm aware we've had no complaints of of noise no one's come to me or staff um about about that so it proves that we can successfully run the area to nine o'clock anyway in in you know in what would probably be the busiest time for outside in, in 10 weeks of of English summer. Um, if on a personal level, if there are any problems with, with noise, then I'm happy for the neighbours across the road to have my telephone number. You know, I mean, I say no one, no one's coming to the bar with, it, with any, any complaints, but if anybody, you know, any neighbours across the road, such as, you know, um, Andrew Sanger, the council, councillor member, uh, then I'm happy for him to, um, to have my details. Um, Abby Brownsword has my details on file. Um, 
if customers are talking too loudly, then our staff have been trained to go outside and tell them to lower the voices. Um, we do have signs in place telling people as you leave the premises to leave quietly. Uh, I think there's a comment on about people using benches outside when we're closed. I mean, it isn't an issue out of hours. I think I think during lockdown, I think a few of the the shop the shop owners were using it to uh, to picnic outside there on their lunch break. But uh, I think that's as, as bad as it got. Um, I think that's it. I mean, the, the other comment from from Councillor Woodcraft saying I should have con contingency plan for such an event. I think was a bit uh, a bit offensive. I think no one saw the international. Yeah, pandemic. let's not get personal. <laughs> yeah, so I just uh, just wanted to, to raise that. You've gone on. So he disappeared. Sorry, you've, you've, sorry yeah. I on my keypad. There, I do apologise. Um, you've got uh, twenty seconds left. <laughs> I, I think that I think that's it. So, if there's any, any questions, but yeah, those are those are the points I wanted to, to raise. Really, okay. thank you very much for consideration. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's not a Q and A, but the officer will respond. And um, yeah. Okay then, thank oh, you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, James. Uh, could James could leave the meeting, please? Get on mute. Okay, Dinah, if you'd like to respond, please to comments <laughs> where appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the the temporary nature of the recommendation, it's recommended for uh, approval for a period of twelve months. Um, and uh, James suggested that the government's temporary uh, 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 ca cafe pavement scheme might be extended, but for the moment that only extends, as far as we're aware, until the end of 2020. So um, it, granting consent could bring it in line, this, this consent in line with um, an extended government scheme, but at the moment the government scheme uh, uh, only extends to the end of 2020. Um, I think it's worth saying that we granted or we recommended uh, a temporary um, approval um, just because of the, uh, while it is in a local shopping area and there are active uses, uh, later uses in the shopping area, there's a takeaway next door that opens until 11 o'clock, there is a small co-op supermarket that opens until 10 o'clock, we're quite satisfied that in the early to mid evening there is sufficient background noise level for this not to be a problem, particularly given its small size. Um, but later on in the evening, when, when background noise levels are, are, um, uh, uh, um, are quieter, uh, we, we would be concerned that um, uh, outdoor seating may cause problems. Um, but we also felt it was appropriate because um, to, um, to, given um, the proximity of the site to residential properties, including immediately opposite, um, that a 12 months consent would allow us time to assess whether um, whether the proposal did raise any issues at the end of that 12 months, if there haven't been any complaints, and I'm not aware of there being any complaints so far, um, then we would probably encourage the applicant to reapply for a more permanent um, opening hours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Price, you're not muted. Could you just mute? Sorry. It's okay, don't worry, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. I'm opening this up to questions. Any members got any questions? I've got Councillor McCann, Councillor Rosling Joseph. Okay, I'll start there. And Councillor Huggan. Okay, Councillor McCann. Yes, Chair. Um, <clears throat> whilst that I, I don't see a real problem with the granting this, to be fair, one thing, question I would like, which I know it's a separate issue, but have the uh, licensing uh, department given indication as to whether the license covers this or not for these times? Thank you, Dinah. Thank you. Uh, the, the applicant would have to seek, well, the, the, there are temporary coronavirus license, um, pavement cafe license the scheme as well. So the license would cover them until nine o'clock, as far as I'm aware. Um, until the end of December, if that's extended, um, then then they would wouldn't have to uh, seek a new license. But we haven't been in contact with licensing because that's a separate um, procedural matter. Okay, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Councillor Rosling Josephs. It's okay, Chair. I found the answer in the report. I, I didn't I hadn't seen it before. What I was looking for was in the report. I'm okay. Oh, I love you today then for that. Councillor Huggan. 
I just want to ask you about the seating. If uh, the the lice, the what, what we're giving is for, for the seating, which is exactly where it is. Yes, just want to clarify that because I've cycled I've cycled past there, and there seems to be more seating at other times. That's all. Okay, Diana. It's for use of the area rather than the actual seating arrangement. I think I believe most of the seating that's already there is is in a fixed position, and then it would be up to the applicant to. Um, manage that or manage use of that in a in accordance with um, obviously social distancing restrictions. Hey Councillor Hogan, you okay with that answer? Nothing? Okay then. Any more questions from any members? Comments then. I'll move on to comments. Councillor Price, you can unmute Councillor Price then. <laughs> Thank you Chair. Uh, I don't see any problem at all with this Chair. To be in a midnight, 11 o'clock, I can understand it, but 9 o'clock, I don't affect anybody. And there are a number of it, uh, sites around the city having a similar sort of setup, Spe especially as it's too close by uh, retail and it's opened up much later. I see no problem at all, and I would have given enough a long, a long term at license. And I wish him all the very best, Chair, and good luck in the future. Thank you, and mute yourself. <laughs> Can you mute yourself? Thank you. That's lovely. Councillor McCann. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I have been involved in running pubs in the past, and they are a very difficult uh, mm. vehicle to steer these days, and particularly in this current climate. I think we need to support all small businesses as much as we possibly can. So mm. I will be supporting this one. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Any more comments from any members? No? Okay. So we'll go to the vote. The proposal is to grant planning permission subjection to amended condition 10. All those that support the officer recommendation. So, okay, we'll go to the vote. Councillor Diane Hurst. <laughs> For the officer recommendation, Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor, oh, one minute. Councillor Adam Hurst. <laughs> uh, yeah, for the, uh, for the officer recommendation, uh, Chair. Councillor Alan Law. You're muted. He's not. He's unmuted. You are unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Tony Dams. Four, Chair. Councillor Peter Garbett. Four, Chair. Councillor Peter Price. Four, Chair. Councillor Bob McCann. Four, Chair. Councillor Zahir Anaz. Four, Chair. Councillor Chris Rosling Josephs. Four chair. And Councillor Tim Huggan. Four chair. Okay, I think that's unanimous on 10, Abby, isn't it? Okay, support the officer recommendation. Proposed planning permission is granted. We need to bring Councillor Sangar back into the meeting. Would members like a comfort break now or would they prefer one after the next item? Now. OK, so we'll take her, if you could bring her, yeah, Councillor Sangar back in. Welcome back, Councillor Sangar. We are going to have a 10 minute comfort break before we move on to the next item. OK, if everyone could um, take their videos off. And, OK, lovely, brilliant. We're going to go on to item 60 which is application number 20-01489-FUL, which is a full planning application. The proposal is demolition of dwelling house and erection of nine apartments and three dwelling houses with associated landscaping, parking, access works and boundary treatments. The location is 83 Red Myers Road, Sheffield S10, 4B. And the officer is Michael Johnson. If you'd like to introduce Mike, please, Michael. You're muted. <laughs> You're still muted. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Chair. We've lost the screen now. I know, it was a, too technical for me to unmute while sharing the screen. <laughs> um, <Sad. laughs> um, right, try that again. Um, Chair, Brilliant, sorry, well done. Uh, the application is for the demolition of an existing large detached dwelling house um, and the erection of a new building to house nine apartments with three muse houses in the in the in the existing rear garden of the dwelling house. 
Um, just to run through the plans, Chair, so we've got Red Myers Road sitting to the north with the golf course on the other side of Red Myers Road. The red line dictates the, the application site, and you'll see the large property there fronting the street and the large garden here. To the right-hand side, Chair, um, to the east, you've got an existing um, large apartment building with a rear car park. Um, and to the west, you've got an existing detached, large detached property. Just some photographs, Chair. This is the front of the existing property. Um, and this is it at the rear looking from the bottom of, of the existing garden. Um, another image here looking from the existing garden to the right hand side or the east, which shows you the neighbouring apartment building. Um, this chair, and I'll just go back up a slide. This is looking in this direction, chair, so, so to the south east towards the properties on the ridge. Um, which is this, so you can see um, the ridge of the ridge, um, if you excuse the phrase, um, here. And the next image again, you can just see again the roof and the ridge line, line of the properties that sit on that cul-de-sac that's known as the ridge. So it's looking down the garden to the left-hand side. This is looking at the other side of the garden chair. So again, I'll just, I'll just flash back here and it's looking along this boundary here to the west chair when, when we look at this photograph. Um, just to show sort of the mature boundary that sits along there. And you can see here, we're standing on the slightly raised patio of the existing property. Again, Chair, this is on the other side of Red Myers Road, looking at the existing property here. Um, this here shows the apartments in this location and the existing property there. And these images are just to demonstrate um, how there's a, there is a, a quite a strong level of screening but from the properties being set back and the existing street trees. Um, and again, this kind of indicates how the, the limitations in terms of the visibility of the existing property when viewed from more oblique angles approaching. And this is the property, the neighboring detached house um, chair that sits to the west of the existing site. Chair, these are the plans showing the proposed building. So these are the three sort of muse houses and we've got some images of those in a little while. And this is the apartment block that's proposed. Um, you'll see that 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 line there dictates the sort of the, the taller element with a, a single story sort of rear terrace at the back, which again we'll we'll, we'll come on to. Um, again, you've got the existing apartments here. These are the properties that sit on the ridge, the cul-de-sac known as the ridge, and this is the detached property that sits next door. Um, similar chair, this just dictates the retention of the mature boundary that sits to the west and to the east of the site. Um, and again, it just shows the relationships and it shows more clearly the, 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 the sort of the, the, the three story element of the apartment block, which is dictated in white and the, the sort of the lower scale terrace rear amenity space and balconies, which are dictated in the dark um, grey. Again, you see parking here dedicated to each of the houses, some parking here for the apartments. And there is also an undercroft that sits underneath these apartments, Chair, that you don't quite pick up here that's accessed around this point for some additional parking within the basement. And um, just briefly, Chair, this is a tree retention plan. There are some trees to be removed as part of facilitating the development. There's a detailed tree report that's been submitted that identifies any trees that are being removed as category C or category U trees, which are the lower category trees and there's tree replacement being proposed. Those trees marked with a red outline here are the trees that are being retained. And again, this shows the mature sort of trees retained along the west and retained along the east. And that includes the hedges chair, which you can just pick up with these red lines here as well. Um, just briefly, Chair, elevations. This faces Red Miles Road, so this is the front elevation and this is the rear elevation and you see that it's dug into the back and that reflects the topography of the site to a degree which you'll pick up on this image. Um, the Muse houses set at the back, Chair, so they're sort of two storeys at this point with some room in the roof space as well. All quite contemporary design and we, we feel the contemporary design, there are various nods to the existing sort of vernacular with gable features and different things, but there is a variety of, uh, of design within the vicinity. So we feel a contemporary approach is fine from an officer perspective. Um, and you'll see some visuals here of the Muse houses. Um, 
And just here, Chair, just to give you some appreciation of the existing property versus the apartments. And the, the dash line shows the sort of the footprint and the height of the existing building. And this is the proposed apartment building. It demonstrates that it's, it, it's matching the ridge of the apartments that's set next door. So it sort of sits OK from an officer perspective. We feel it sits OK in terms of the adjacent building because it's not going above the ridge there before it steps back down to this detached property in this location. And again, just a few CGI's, Chair. These are the three news houses at the bottom of the garden. Um, and these are the, these are the apartments that front onto Red Myers Road. And that's it for the presentation, Chair. Just a very brief supplementary, just to say that there's a proposed additional condition that just asks for these four windows here to be obscure glazed. Um, we don't feel it's necessary. They'll be necessarily overly problematic, Chair. They're set in this in this vicinity, so they're very close to the sort of the, the, the hedging and the trees in any case. But we feel from a belt and braces perspective that those, those, those windows, it would be appropriate for them to be obscure glazed. So there's an additional condition proposed um, just, to, just to secure that. Um, that's all I've got, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll um, sh stop sharing now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. OK, we just have the one speaker in favour of the application, and that's Sir Rob Caro Carola. OK, if we could bring him in, please, Jay. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, that's better. We can only see top of your head then. <laughs> Lovely. Sorry <about> the name. <laughs> oh, I'm having real trouble today, aren't I? I need to have English. I think I need to have some phonetics sent me beforehand. <laughs> Lovely. If you want, you've got five minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. I'll keep this uh, uh, very brief. Um, thank you for the opportunity to appear in support of my client's application for the development now before you. Uh, my client is very excited by the prospect of bringing this development to the market and providing a high quality development, which will be liked by current and future residents of Sheffield. Uh, the development has been through many design iterations, even in advance of submission of the planning application. The pre-application process was very beneficial in agreeing principles and fine tuning design details. And I thank the case officer for his input uh, in, in regard of that. Now, turning to the scheme itself, we feel it is well thought through that the result is a development which is of high quality. To reiterate the key attributes, the scheme will be built using high quality materials, ashlar stone, brick, powder coated aluminium windows, zinc cladding. The, the apartments are designed for modern living. They're highly efficient, high levels of insulation and renewable energy uh, sources. Each apartment will have its own dedicated fast EV car charging point to future proof the development. The apartments are light and spacious and we've finished and turned it to very high specification. Each apartment has either its own private terrace, balcony or garden and provide good accessibility with undercroft parking and lift access. In terms of the Muse houses, these are of modern design, each having a front garden with private driveway for two cars and good sized south facing rear gardens. Again designed and built to be highly efficient, each getting an EV charging point highly insulated and utilising renewable energy sources and technologies. And the scheme will be thoughtfully landscaped using appropriate materials and planting. There are additional benefits as well, which accrue from the development. These are providing new housing in this area of Sheffield, helping to meet part of Sheffield's wider housing need, providing accommodation which will be attracted to a wide sector of the housing market, helping to retain and potentially attract new residents to Sheffield, and increasing expenditure retention and receipt generation generally in Sheffield. Turning quickly to planning policy, the development we feel is policy compliant in that it is located in an area identified as being suitable for additional housing. It makes efficient use of land located within the Sheffield built up area. Site density is appropriate to the scale of the site. The accommodation is in accord with internal space standards applicable. The site can be accessed and egressed safely and efficiently. The relationship of the buildings to adjacent dwellings and street scene is acceptable and appropriate, not resulting in any overshadowing, overlooking or privacy issues. The development does not raise any issues related to ecology, flood risk, contamination or any of the material conservation and the scheme provides appropriate levels of private and public amenity space. 
In determining applications, councils must consider the requirements of the National Planning Policy Framework and the presumption in favour of sustainable development. This development constitutes sustainable development. Accordingly, paragraph 11 of the MPPF requires that, in terms of decision making, this means approving development proposals that accord with an up to date development plan without delay. Also, planning law requires that planning permission should be granted for development that is in accordance with the development plan unless other material considerations indicate otherwise. There are no issues which are so material such to require refusal of the application, and we consider it a quality scheme, and it should be approved as, par, as per the officer recommendation. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jay. If you could uh, Rob could leave the meeting. Fine, Michael, I'll hand back over to you to respond to the speaker. Nothing to add, Chair. Lovely, thank you very much. I'll open this up to questions from the committee. Anyone wish to ask a question? I've got Councillor Sangar. Anyone else? Councillor Garbutt. Just those two at the moment. Councillor Sangar, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> welcome back. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, yeah, one of the things residents wanted to ask was was this issue issue about drainage because we're at the, the top of the hill there and the, the soil's quite quite thin o, o, over the rock. So, so are there any are there any potential surface drainage problems on this site? Um, Chair, our drainage technicians, I, I can't give you the detailed answer there. Our drainage technicians would look into that and and take the stuff sort of standard hierarchical approach to to trying to deal with that. So. That that look at whether we can deal with it through sustainable measures such as soak waste. But if not, then I think I think we'd have to look at sort of existing connections into 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 um, Yorkshire Waters facilities. Okay, and 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 the and the other thing is very much that this this is, you know, two two sets of buildings. It's it's the it's the the apartment block and, the, and then the, the muse houses and the muse houses are, are classified as as building on on, on green field and, and i i got the impression from i got the impression from from the report that that's pretty marginal in terms of um in terms of core po strategy policy cs24 in terms of do we need to build on that on, on those green fields because this is not because Actually, that that part of this this application is not a, a, is not a developed site. Yeah, in, in relation to the sort of the core strategy policy, the core strategy acknowledges that um, that across the sort of the, the plan period, Sheffield will need to develop on certain greenfield sites, that which includes domestic gardens such as this. I think it identifies twelve percent of completions across that period of time. Sheffield. Are got approximately six percent at the moment so there's quite a lot of headroom before we get to the core strategy limit added to that is the sort of the the MPPF which obviously um, obviously comes after the core strategy and certainly promotes um, a slightly different approach in terms of greenfield in the sense that it looks at rather than rather than restricting to 12 percent or a percentage it, it, it asks it asks the decision maker to to look at a decision and a development on a greenfield site in a balanced way across the entire framework rather than putting a ceiling on on, on what can and can't be completed so both of those documents um there's some synergy between them but they've both got the same principle which is greenfield development works um, the restrictions that are in the core strategy policy haven't been hit in any case in relation to completions uh, th 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 thanks chair I mean, i'll come back with comments Okay, I'll pop you down for that. Okay, Councillor Garbutt, you have a Thank question. You, Thank you, Chair. I've got about three or four. Um, okay. First, first is parking. Um, one of the uh, objections suggested that there really wasn't enough space to um, manoeuvre for parking. Um, I, I, I didn't see a particular response to that in your report. Um, so can you suggest to me or can you explain to me how how that might work. I think I counted seven spaces at the back. Um, and I think the entrance to the undercroft is also at the back at the rear. Am I right in that? That's the first question. I'll come back and ask the others later. Michael. A check and I defer to Mark, please. Yeah, of course you can. Where's Mark? I can't see him. Hmm. Oh, is 
Jasper. Sorry, Mark. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You've moved on my screen. This is all very confusing. I had you all in my head. <laughs> Yeah, Been replaced um, by Adam. <laughs> yeah, in, in terms of the parking, yeah, there's um, there are eleven spaces in the undercroft, uh, which is accessed as uh, Michael said from the from from the rear towards the rear. Uh, we're, we're we're quite happy with the layout. I don't know if Michael's got any plans showing the layout. Um, at the time, we felt it was it was a reasonable layout, um, and there are seven spaces actually in the forecourt to add to those eleven basement um, spaces. Um, and the, the houses each have a, a couple of spaces on plot. Um, I mean, if, if, if there was some demand for visitor parking, there is actually um, a lay-by um, that, that is used as a drop-off for the school just to the east uh, of this site off Red Myers Road. So potentially some overspill parking if, if visitors wanted to use that, 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 that's also an option. But yeah, we felt that the, um, the amount and the the layout of the parking seemed acceptable to us. Thank you. Thanks uh, for that. Um, uh, the next question is, is regarding the the, um, the insulation, the, the building um, standard for uh, heat insulation. Uh, and I think the report mentioned something about solar panels, but I haven't heard anything about it um, uh, today. So I wondered if um, there was some uh, uh, ongoing discussions on that and uh, you know is, is there something that you could help us out with on that one today? Yeah uh, the, there's a planning condition um, and the sort of the standard planning condition that secures the core strategy policy requirement for 10% of energy to be provided through re renewable or low enough. carbon so the details the finer details of that which could include P, um, PV panels um, Will be secure. Will be dealt with through the, the conditions. Um, in terms of just general building um, energy efficiency in relation to construction, that's that's now dealt with um, under the envelope of building control. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And my last question then is um, also in the report. There was something to do with um, an objection because the garden had been used by various animals, such as I think foxes, badgers were were mentioned. Um, and in the report it said no evidence of that. Can you explain how that evidence or the lack of evidence or whatever the report uh, um, suggests, how that came about, how, how the lack of any evidence was, uh, was shown? Sure, yeah, of course, there was um, an ecology survey carried out to just investigate the, the, the potential for badges on the site um, following uh, re reports from in some of the reps that have been received from interested third parties um, and a, a qualified ecologist carried that out and there was no evidence found of, of badges um, badger sets on the site or, or badges using the site. Okay, thanks. That's, that's me done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Garber. Um, any more questions from any members? Okay, comments. I have Councillor Sangal. Anyone else wish to make a comment? Councillor Price? Okay, Councillor Sango, your comment, please. Th th thank you, Chair. And I've struggled with this with with this one for for, for some time. Um, and I I certainly welcome welcome the additional condition. I think that's really helpful in terms of screening between this site and and eighty five. Um, I, I, I it was fairly clear once it came in that the idea of removing a large a, a large dwelling of limited architectural merit and no and, and not part of a, and, and, and no clear street scene and replacing it with a block of apartments um, is, is a sort of thing that we're going to need to do across Sheffield um, so so that was never rid of the challenge the cha the challenge was about about the muse homes and building on building on 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 the green part of the garden and I think I found the site visit very useful because although I know the roads very well until you actually go on the site and see the size of it and see that the developers have actually been quite modest in terms of in terms of the, the scale of the muse house and I think for all of that um, on balance I say I will be supporting the officer's recommendation as I say you know we do need we do need more houses in Sheffield and we do need to build uh, in, in, in the urban part of the city to protect protect our green belt. So Thank I you, Councillor Sangal. Yeah, 
Thank you. Councillor Price, your comment, please. Well, Councillor Sangar stole what I'm going to say. I can't see any <laughs> single planning reason for turning it down, Chair. I think that the, 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 the fairly attractive building certainly support the officer recommendation. Lovely. Yeah, um, I must admit, I um, I had some concerns, but when I went on the site visit and saw um, where the Muse House was, and I think I welcome the smaller size properties that are actually homes as well there, which is great for downsizing to stay in the area. So, um, yeah, I think it's really, really impressive. Any more comments anyway? OK, so the officer will go to, yeah, the officer recommendation is to grant conditionally. So we'll go to the vote. OK, uh, Councillor Diane Hurst. Or Chair. Thank you. Councillor Andrew Sangar. Or Chair. Councillor Adam Hurst. Or Chair. Councillor Alan Law. Or oh, Chair. Councillor Tony Dance. Or oh, Chair. Councillor Peter Garbutt. Or oh, Chair. Councillor Peter Price. Or. Oh. Councillor Bob McCann. Or oh, Chair. Councillor Zahira Nas. Or oh, Chair. Councillor Chris Rosling Joseph. Or oh, Chair. And Councillor Tim Huggan. Or oh, Chair. Lovely. I make that um, 11, Abby. Is that correct? OK, that, that is granted. OK, we'll move on to item 6F. Let me piece the paper, excuse me, everyone. OK, which is page 157 on your agenda. It's application number 20 stroke 01 stroke 01666 stroke F. UL. It's a full planning application. The proposal is the use of dwelling house, use class C3 as a seven bed house in multiple occupant, occupant, occupation, HMO, use class one Sue Generous, associated alterations including the erection of a dormer window to, to rear, roof light to front and removal of ground floor rear access. The location is 131 Rock Street, Sheffield S3 9JP and the officer presenting is Diana Hope. Diana, if you'd like to present, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just talk through the, the presentation on the screen. Um, this uh, aerial shot shows the site here of 131 Rock Street. This is Rock Street to the east. This is Fox Street to the west, which is at a significantly higher level. This site to the west of Fox Street, uh, if I move on to the next slide, is the site of the recently constructed Australia Academy. There's some photographs of the, um, the property, 131 uh, Rock Street. The, the property is currently vacant. Um, this is uh, the rear elevation, a jaunty shop there. Um, the rear garden, uh, looking up the rear garden uh, towards the rear boundary and you can see the school in the background there. Um, again, another shot of the rear elevation. Um, this is the front uh, door. Um, it's actually raised above the highway. Um, again, shots in and out of the rear garden um, and shots of the rear side boundary uh, and Fox Street from um, across the road. Uh, this uh, is a site plan. Um, Number 131 is a semi-detached property. As I said, it's elevated above Rock Street. Uh, it's below Fox Street. It's got a, a generous size rear garden uh, and the plan shows areas for bin storage and um, cycle storage. Although there is a condition attached to the recommendation asking for full details of secure covered cycle parking. Um, and this is the uh, layout of the proposed um, a HMO. Uh, there is storage in the basement. We have three bedrooms uh, and three bathrooms at ground floor level. We have two bedrooms and a large kitchen dining room at first floor level, and then two additional bedrooms in the, um, uh, on the sec second floor. And then externally, the only alteration uh, proposed is a, a rear dormer window. So, I think it's worth um, just uh, highlighting some key points from the officer report. 
um, and that is that the concentration of shared housing within 200 metres of this site is currently 4%. And that's well below the 20% threshold set by policy CS41 of the core strategy. And that the existing house can be used as a HMO for up to six people without planning permission. And officers consider that the impact of an additional bedroom to create a HMO for seven people is unlikely to have a um, material impact um, or harm the living conditions of neighbours or the character um, of the area to a significant degree. And I'd just like to draw uh, members attention to the supplementary, which simply explains that a directive on the uh, decision, um, the recommendation directive number three for details of a vehicle crossing uh, is not required. Thank you. Thank you, Dinah. We just have one speaker on this application and they are speaking in support of it. And it's an Andy pickup. If you could bring Andy in, please, Jay. Welcome, Andy. Hi there, you're okay. I am good, thank you. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Right, you have five minutes. <laughs> Thank you and hello everyone and uh, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, first of all, I'd just like to point out that um, just with regards to this application that we'd like to convert uh, the property into a high-end uh, seven-bedroom co-living HMO accommodation. Um, we'd also, as, as mentioned by the officer, that uh, a six-bedroom co-living accommodation would, would not require planning permission and could be converted uh, under permit development rights. As, as it is at the moment. So we're technically only really applying for one. Andy, can I just stop you? Your, your sound keeps disappearing, so yeah. I'm just conscious. Yeah, yeah. sorry, can yeah. you? Yeah, okay, I'll pause for you. Yeah. I just didn't want you to, didn't want the members to miss what you were saying. Yeah, is that any better? That's much better, thank yeah. you very right. much. Okay. Right. No, 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 no problem. But if you want to just, you know, backtrack a sentence. Yeah, I'll turn. I've got a fan on in the background. Can I turn that off? Is that? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, it was a bit warm apparently. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I shouldn't complain. It's a nice day out there today. <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, don't. It'll soon be winter. Right then, yeah. we'll get back to business. Thank uh, you. Do you want me to start again? I don't know how much you heard. We heard, no, just, just backtrack a sentence, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, um, so yeah, I was just um, just saying that we are just acquiring permission technically for just one extra bedroom for the person, um, for the seven bedroom co-living accommodation. And I, I just wanted to cover the concerns highlighted uh, with regards to the noise um, that, that's been brought up. Um, our client has um, other properties very similar to this and they use a very reputable Lesson agents, which have systems in place to manage issues and noise uh, and any antisocial behaviour issues, and they will not be tolerated. Uh, in addition to that, uh, noise uh, proofing and soundproofing measures will be incorporated within uh, the build of the, the conversion, which which is all monitored by building control and will be installed as, as per building regulations. Um, with regards to the concerns on overcrowding, uh, the property is, is seven bedroom proposed and upon completion of the conversion, Sheffield HMO Licensing Department will be inspecting the property and will only issue a licence for the uh, appropriate occupants, which we've assumed of seven occupants. Um, so we, we don't feel that overcrowding will be an issue. So I just wanted to point out that that will be the discretion of the HMO department of Sheffield Council and the license requirements and, and a various way of making sure that the property is fit for purpose um, and to a good standard. Um, so yeah, with regards to building regulations, as I mentioned, uh, we will be upgraded to incorporate fire and soundproofing uh, to make sure that all fire escape routes uh, are covered and the, the fire regulations are met along with soundproofing and energy performance of the property uh, to ensure that it's any any necessary upgrades to bring to, to bring obviously the, the running 
the running costs and the efficiency of, of the property. Um, with regards to parking, uh, the position of the property, as, as we've just shown, is, is very close to the, uh, the city centre and is within walking distance. So public walking, public transport and cycling would, would be encouraged. Uh, so we've not, not got any formal car parking spaces. There is off-street parking. Um, and, and with regards to the size of the property, the, if it was a family home, they would probably have more cars than, than this type of development anyway. Um, yeah, with regards to the dormer window, the dormer window is set within the roof line and is quite typical for the area. And there's a lot of dormer windows in the area that are very similar in design. Um, but also just um, additional comments uh, with regards to the number of occupants, uh, as I mentioned above, will be dictated by licensing. Uh, but just given the property is already an existing four bedroom house, th this could have potentially up to eight family members living in the property anyway, uh, so which is technically probably more than the, than the proposal. Um, so, so just to conclude, we, we do feel that this is a sustainable location for this type of living accommodation, and there is a large demand this type of property and uh, uh, for the low cost modern living accommodation in and around the centre uh, and this being very close to the centre and we feel the application should be approved as per the officer's recommendation for approval. Uh, so I would just like to thank you for that Chair. Thank, thank you. you very much, thank you Andy, thank you. Please. Jay if we could remove Andy, Dinah if you'd like to respond please. I don't think I have anything to add to that, Chair. Thank you. Okay, okay. well, I will go to um, questions from members. Okay, just one second. I've got Councillor Price and Councillor McCann and Councillor yes, Hurst. Wait, just one second. Right, Peter. <laughs> yes, um, first of all, I'd like officers to justify this. This is a small house with seven bedrooms. That's 14 people. No car parking space at all where else in the city would we agree approval with that sort of a, 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 a op option no no car parking 14 people in a small house in one of the most deprived areas uh, i just don't understand the recommendation to accept this chair please justify it for me thank you chair um as Andy just uh, explained previously, the HMO is for seven people and not only do they need planning permission for seven people, they don't need planning permission for a HMO for six, they do for seven, but they also need a, a, a Sheffield licence, HMO licence, and that will regulate the number of people that can live in the property. So it will be seven people in what, uh, on, on, in accommodation over four floors, um, well, th sorry, the, the property spreads over four floors. The basement will be used for um, storage and bedrooms over three floors. It has a good size garden. Uh, it's in a sustainable location. Um, and what officers have to consider is the material difference between a HMO for six people, which doesn't need planning permission, and a HMO for seven people. And that's the key consideration uh, as discussed in the report. Um, so, um, and, and officers feel that that difference, the difference of one person, is likely to have a material impact. But Chair, it's seven bedrooms, not seven people, and how do you stop two people going to a bedroom? Where do they cook and everything else? In? <laughs> well, well, because, because, sorry Chair, thank you, um, there, are, there are seven bedrooms, um, but as I said, the restriction of the planning consent is for seven people, the license would be for seven people and the property as uh, the speaker explained will be managed um, so they will have to manage it in accordance with their their license Councillor price okay I'll, I'll comment later chair okay i'll pop you down okay lovely councillor mccann yeah, thank you chair um, there's a mention of uh, removal of the uh, rear ground floor access how does that comply with the uh, fire escape rules and uh, things of that nature. Have we got any details on that? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. The, there's, there's currently a, um, a rear door, um, which is from, as in a family house, it's from a, a communal room. That room would become a bedroom, um, but you can um, access the rear garden by leaving the front door and walking down the passageway 
a lot down the side of the house that provides access to the rear garden and then from the rear garden you can exit out onto Fox Street or you can obviously um, leave on to, to Rock Street um, and I think it's worth mentioning that that uh, again as the speaker said this um, uh, development will also need building regulations so fire safety will be covered as part of that and it being a ground floor you'll be able to escape out the window in any case. Chair, sure, can I come back on that? Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I mean, the thing is, effectively, you've essentially got one door access or a, 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 a escape route on that. And I can't see in a multi house of multiplication that, that is quite acceptable, personally. Um, and I'm, 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 I mean, have the fire brigade had any input on this sort of uh, discussion? No, um, I mean, as I said, as has been said previously, this is a, a good sized family house over four floors. It already has bedrooms in the roof. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, people will have to escape um, from those bedrooms by using the one staircase. Um, the uh, all ground floor uh, windows can be classed as fire escapes. Um, there is a door uh, to, to the front, which leads both to the front and the rear of the site. And again, um, the, the proposal will need building regulations approval uh, and that will also cover um, uh, fire safety issues such as um, uh, escape routes. Mm, I'll, I'll Thank comment, you. Chair, later. Thank you, Councillor McCann. Councillor Adam Hurst. Your Thank question. you, Chair. Um, there's a couple of things. One of them I just want a little bit of clarification because when uh, Diana was going through the plans, I was trying to keep up with them, and I'm not very quick at reading plans. Can I just check how there's seven bedrooms, and did I see three bathrooms, or is there a bathroom and, and, and toilet basically for each bedroom? And am I right that the kitchen facilities are going to be shared? That's my first question. Uh, I'll put in the second one because it does relate to the one that my councillor Price asked, which is if you've got seven bedrooms. How do you actually enforce somebody not moving in a partner at some stage or another? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dinah. Thank you. Um, I, I believe there are well, there, there are three bathrooms uh, on the ground floor, um, and there are two on the second floor. So I think there are five bathrooms altogether. So some are en suite. Oh, sorry, no, I think there's one on the first floor as well. In fact, should we should we share the screen? It might be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, bear with me. Um, so there we go. So yes, as I said, there are three uh, bathrooms. Two are en suite uh, on the ground floor. There is one on the first floor, and then two en suite bathrooms on the second floor. I'll stop sharing. And then, in terms of um, re regulating. Uh, the accommodation as I said before I mean it, you know it needs planning permission it needs a license SCC license um, and it, it will also be managed the accommodation um, and like with all um, uh, developments uh, the owners then is then on the, uh, the occupant the manager the owner of the property to make sure it's run in accordance with the, the restrictions of their license and that will be for seven people we can't assume that people are going to to break the law when we're uh, when we are um, approving a development. Just, just a quick one, if I may, chair, um, because yeah, I mean, I get that, and I don't want to get too pedantic. But where does having an overnight guest stop, uh, and, and somebody being there more permanently begin? I just, I think it's more of a comment, so I'll keep. Yeah, okay. I can answer that. I mean, for any of us in, in any in any household, we can all have overnight guests. So no, you know, and, and I think the same would apply for a HMO. Um, we, even uh, with the license, but um, for, for se seven residents will be the, the maximum occupancy. Thank you. Councillor Dams. Um, I share um, Councillor McCann's concerns, but presumably that's a responsibility for somebody else, whether it meets the fire regulations. <laughs> but the question I've got is, <clears throat> Will these seven residents be assured short old tenants or will they be on a license? The, the definition of a HO doesn't, doesn't um, 
describe the, the terms of the tenancy. Um, so it's seven people living together um, uh, in, in, a, in a household, um, sharing with shared accommodation. Um, and, and it's likely most, most HMO accommodation will probably uh, give the six months to yearly contracts, but, um, but there will be some variety in the types, uh, depending on the management um, in this case, in the type of um, uh, arrangement for this property. I'd still like to know uh, whether it's a tenancy or a licence, being as we're making, which I, I'm not against this project, but I'd just like to know if it's a licence or a tenancy because it, it does make a difference in how the property can be managed. They will need they will well they will need an SCC license. They will need a a, a Sheffield City Council HMO license. Sorry, sorry, Chair. I know Adam That's don't okay. want to be pedantic, but I'll be pedantic. <laughs> it's not the license for the building. It's the license to occupy that yeah. a tenant would sign rather than an assured short term tenancy. And that um, falls outside the the realms of the planning legislation. I'm afraid. Well, I just well, wondered if the the person that. Uh, reported could just answer that question it's not uh, not confidential at all I just is that answer. something that will be covered with the uh, with the no. when the HMA is granted no or not no it's okay I'm asking yeah let me just ask Diana yeah Trish, sorry Trish, Patricia Trish might, Trish might be able to come in on that point yeah Trish could you answer that for us please um thank you chair through you um the any uh, what's before members at the moment is the principle of the change of use, that's a land use, and so the considerations have to be planning related. Um, there are other regimes who have responsibility for the management of the house. So the licensing regime will cover safety, um, size of rooms and the number of occupants. Um, it's my understanding that um, the sanction is a criminal sanction for breach of license condition for, for running a HMO without license, which is an unlimited fine. So it's quite a serious, it's taken quite seriously in the legislation. And the, um, the arrangement between how it's let to tenants is not a planning consideration. And I hope that assists members. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll accept that chair, but it's just something I would have liked to have known. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Diane Hurst, you indicated you wanted to ask a question. Thank you, Chair. It's following on, on from what um, Councillor Tony James has said. Um, it does make a difference in um, the community concerns about nuisance use of the property. If there's a, a, a secure tenancy agreement, it's a much longer um, legal process to remove the tenant from the property with a, a very high standard of proof. If it's a, a license to use and occupy, the standard of proof is much lower and it's much easier to remove people. Um, can I ask, is it possible for this um, committee to make a, a recommendation with regards to how the property is managed with the use of, of licenses rather than um, tenancy agreements? I will pass that on to Trish, please, if you could respond to that. <laughs> uh, the, the short answer is no, Chair. Um, you, it, any, material, any restrictions have to be related to um, the application. There have to be planning reasons, and there'd be no, it's outside the scope of planning to determine um, on the basis of what arrangements people have to rent, buy or etc properties, it's it's not a concern for members. Members need to consider the land use in line with the policy and any material considerations. That's not a material consideration. The licensing regi regime um, manages um, and dictates the conditions under which the house is let. And again, that's outside planning. I hope that assists. Yeah, it's not always what you might want to hear, but I think you've been quite clear. Um, any more questions? I have a question, if that's if I can take chair's liberty. If this was a house of, you know, with six, could they then let the properties to people as couples 
or would that still be just single if it was just six bedrooms? A HMO for six people is permitted development, but you still have to fall within the defi definition of a HMO for okay. six people. Right, okay, that's fine, thank you. Right, we have comments. Any more questions, just to make sure? Yeah, we have comments. I have Councillor Price, Councillor McCann, and Councillor um, Adam Hurst. Do I have anybody else who wishes to make a comment? You don't want to make a comment, Councillor Hurst. Okay, okay. Oh, yes. Councillor... <laughs> Sorry? No, no, it's okay. Councillor Peter Price, you have a comment. Hello, Chair. I find it very difficult to difficult in supporting this, Chair. Um, I know Burn Green very well and represent the other side of the valley, and I understand how how much multi-block occupation takes place illegally anyway in many of the, the small houses in, the, in these areas. Uh, this, is, this isn't a large property. To have seven bedrooms, it, it, this, the idea that only seven people will live in there, I think is, it, 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 it's over-optimistic. I don't know how many bins that will, will, um, will, end, will, will need to cover these seven bedrooms because uh, it's, a, it's an area that suffers badly from uh, litter, strewn, people dumping stuff. This will ha add to that, that problem. Uh, according to one of the protesters, there's, there's already two HMOs and on that street within 200 metres, and there's 16 HMO properties within 500 metres, all in the Burn Grieve area. Now, I, I'm, I'm very worried about Burn Grieve and the problems that are, are thrown up in that area, and I think a planning approval of this nature simply adds to them. I think, it, uh, as I said, there's no car park in the big... It may be within walking distance, but if anybody goes out down Rock Street, these streets, it's cars parked all down the, the, the road. And this, I don't think any thought has been given into these issues. And I, I think it's a, it'd be a bad mistake to, to allow this building to be increased to seven bedrooms, which would invariably be more than seven people, whatever we say legally, because I know what happens in other properties in the area. Uh, and we're constantly fighting them and chasing up the landlords. So I'm, I'm sorry, Chair, but I can't support the officer's recommendation in this case. Okay, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will support the application on, with reservation. I will like it on record that I have real concerns about the, uh, the fire escape facilities on this in, in any emergency escape because one door, unless the, do unless the windows are specifically designed to allow quick escape, this could yeah. be a very dangerous situation. I think the officers responded to that to say that will be dealt with under the licensing. And if do you know that we're here to consider the planning application, not what would happen under the licensing. But yeah, okay, your comments are noted. Councillor Dams, you have a comment. Mm. Yes, um, I'll be supporting this because my concerns about the safety of this are not planning considerations. But along with Councillor McCann, I do have concerns, um, but I've been advised and accept that they're outside the planning remit. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Anybody else wish to make a comment? Okay, right. So we'll go to the vote. The Office of Recommendation is to grant planning permission subject to proposed conditions. Okay, we'll go to the roll call. Councillor Diane Hurst. Reluctantly, four, Chair. Councillor Andrew Sangal. Uh, very reluctantly, four, Chair. Oh, I think it's about that, anyway. Yeah. Councillor Adam Hurst. Oh, I'm going to stick my neck out and support uh, Pricey on this. I'm uh, against. Okay. Councillor Alan Law. Reluctantly, four. Councillor Tony Dams. I'm not going to stick my neck out for Councillor Price. My neck's far too precious, so I'm voting <laughs> for the application. Councillor Peter Garbutt. Against. Okay. Councillor Peter Price. Against. Councillor Bob McCann. Reluctantly for Chair. <laughs> Councillor Zahir Anas. Against Chair. Did you say against Councillor Naz? Thank you, yeah. Councillor Chris Rosling Josephs. Very reluctantly, four, Chair. Councillor Tim Huggan. Uh, four, reluctantly. Yeah, okay, then. One, two, three, four, five, six. I get seven, four, and one, one, two, three, four against. Is that correct, Abby? Yeah, I get that. 
Okay, so this application is granted. Right, we now move to item 6G, which is the item that I declared an interest on. So I will not be able to chair. So we need, um, I've took legal advice and I just want to uh, check with Trish. Um, we need to, I need to propose for the committee to propose a new chair. That's correct, isn't it? To do this item. Okay, yes. do I leave, do you want me to leave before this or? So um, I, I would recommend that you um, elect a chair to take your place and then leave. Okay, thank you. Um, could I ask Councillor Diane Hurst if she would be willing to chair this item, please? This, I, this item, yes, Chair. Thank mm, you very much. Do I have a seconder for that? I know. I'll say that, yeah. They all want you, Diane. So you can uh, remove me from the meeting, please, Jay. Thank you. Right, thank you, meeting. Uh, change of pace now as I get used to the um, restrictions on chairing with a, um, via Zoom. So this is case number 20-01966-CHU, which was formerly PP-0881738. And it's planning application for a change of use from an office to a beauty salon and the location is Dixon Dawson Chartered Architects, Six Moor Road, Sheffield, S10, 1BX. And the officer that's doing the presentation is Chris, Chris Healy. So Chris, if I can hand over to you um, to talk us through the application, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll just share my screen, uh, first of all, to familiarize members with the site. Um, can everyone see that? Uh, okay, so um, the, the site is in Broom Hill. Uh, it's a single uh, property, detached property here, uh, which is on Moor Oaks Road. Uh, so you can see it stands alone there with, with the terrace properties nearby. Um, and there's a plan that, that confirm, confirms the same. Uh, the images uh, uh, show the property as it stands at the moment. You'll see it's for sale and it is currently vacant. It was a former architect's practice. Uh, that's a, a view from Morox Road. And this is a view uh, from the rear where there are two, uh, two car parking spaces and an external yard. Uh, this part of the site here is a shared access down to uh, land at the back, which you can just see here too. Um, the property is over three floors essentially, a ground floor, first floor and second floor. Um, and, and as you can see here, th this shows the elevations which aren't being altered. So there are no physical alterations to the property as part of this. Um, so essentially it is, it is just the change of use that we're concerned with, which is the use of it is the use of the whole building, but in practice, only the ground floor and first floor will be used, uh, and the proposed use is as a beauty salon. Um, so, if I just return to uh, just to give you to, to leave that there, so you know uh, know the site. Uh, this is um, Broomhill. The Broomhill Centre is in this direction, uh, and the Goodwin Sports Facility here. Um, so it's, as I say, former architect's practice. Uh, the use is, uh, proposed use is a beauty salon. Uh, it was a, it's within a housing area in the UDP uh, and within the Crooks Valley character area in the Bee Best uh, neighborhood plan, uh, which has undergone its consultation period. So has, has some limited weight where its policies align with the, with the MPPF. Uh, it's also in the Broomhill Conservation Area, but as I say, there are no proposed um, alterations to the exterior of the building. Uh, the proposed opening hours are 10 o'clock till 6 o'clock, Monday to Saturday. Uh, and despite what it says in the original report, there is no Sunday, uh, sorry, in the conditions, there is no uh, Sunday opening. And I'll address that point when we get to the supplementary. Uh, there are objections, a number of objections, around 16 in total. Uh, as set out in the report, uh, and I've also got one or two to address in the supplementary as well. 
Um, we're supporting the application because we don't feel the use is intrinsically noisy. Uh, it's not of a level that will generate uh, the amount of uh, movements and turnover of custom that would result in a significant parking problem. Um, and, and there are no external alterations to, to harm the character of the conservation area. Uh, it, it's supported in policy terms. Um, there's no loss of residential use within the area. It's replacing a previous architect's practice. Uh, so overall, our recommendation uh, is to support. Um, if I can just draw uh, members' attention to item four on the supplementary agenda chair, supplementary information. Um, I just need to refer to another screen to, to, to see this. Um, so the first point that we raised there is a clarification around the car parking issues that uh, are flagged up in the report. Uh, there was an error in the report in describing uh, doctors um, and dentists as being a, a, a class D2 use. Um, and then there was a subsequent explanation of what kind of levels of parking that would require. Um, that, that was an error. So uh, we're, we're, this, the purpose of this is to say, uh, to, to not consider that. Um, uh, the, there are no specific guidelines referring to the proposed use in the, in the council car parking guidelines. It's a sui generis use. There are no specific uh, guidelines of one space per number of square meters or, or, or whatever. Um, and there is also no reference to, to doctors and, and, and dentist uses. And the reason we're referring to those uses is that this particular salon operates in a way that is similar uh, in terms of uh, appointment based activities. And, and quite lengthy processes. Uh, so it's not a quick uh, turnover. Um, car parking guidelines in the UDP refer to one space per medical practitioner on duty at the busiest time. Um, and the applicant indicates there'll be a, um, two practitioners uh, at any one time. There are four treatment rooms within the facility. So there is the potential for that to expand Although we understand that uh, the treatment rooms will, um, the, the practitioners will flip between the rooms as you might often do with something like a, a physiotherapy use, for example. Um, so the long and short of that is that uh, we don't feel that the conclusions of the highways element of the report are any different to, to what they were before we um, acknowledge this error chair. Um, so uh, we still feel that the, the likely um, potential generation of a maximum of five uh, visitors, five car parking spaces being in demand at any one time uh, is such that we don't feel it's a concern in this area. There is permit parking, uh, which ties in the hours of operation of that tie in with the, the hours of use. Uh, and actually the length of some of the appointments would uh, preclude anyone from using those anyway. So they're more than likely to find, customers are more than likely to find parking elsewhere. Uh, where it's not restricted or seek alternative um, mode of transport. Um, the, there are 16 representations in total, with, which is a clarification on that point, and uh, an additional rep representation from the Broomhill and Sherabale Green Party. Um, the comments raised by the Green Party uh, are, are very similar to those uh, elsewhere within the report, but are set out within the supplementary. Uh, for clarification. Um, so it's around things like noise, traffic, car parking, uh, and the use being uh, detached from the retail area. Condition four is amended to confirm that there is no Sunday opening chair. Uh, and then there is an additional condition, uh, which is, is the intention of that is to protect neighboring residents from any external plant that might be fitted for things like air conditioning, cooling, uh, or other, other forms of um, internal facilities that require an external vent. Uh, and that, that's quite a standard condition for this kind of activity. So the re recommendation stays the same, Chair, which is to support uh, the application. Um, and I've got nothing further to add after that. Okay, thank you for that, Chris. Um, Abby, have it got any speakers against this application? I've checked, there's, there's no speakers for this application. There are no speakers at all for this application? No. Okay. 
correct. In that case, I'll move to members' questions. Do I, are any members? Right, I've got, first of all, I've got Councillor McCann, I've got Councillor Tim Hogan. So, Councillor McCann. Thank you, Chair. Um, on the uh, access uh, element of it, it says quite clearly that it's not access accessible by dis people with disabilities. And this obviously, in my opinion, flies directly in the face of the disability legislation. So how can we uh, support this application? Chris, uh, would you like to come in here? Uh, yes, Chair. The uh, the report does does address that. Well, addresses the points of access, uh, and uh, and it might be worth me sharing the screen again if members prefer. Uh, but there is a considerable level difference between um, the uh, the footpath in in the highway uh, and the the main access to the uh, to the property. Well, the only access to the property for for customers. Um, and, and the, the level difference is, is so significant that it's not feasible to, to achieve what would be a, um, a, a compliant ramp, for instance, with the appropriate uh, gradients. It's just the space in front of the site doesn't allow for it. Um, so what we've asked for uh, in, within uh, one of the conditions that's, uh, that's enclosed within the report uh, is, is details to be submitted of measures that will, that will aid um, customers uh, with difficulty in accessing the property. Now that might include something like handrails, for instance, because there is there is a stepped access. There is in the order of uh, six or seven steps up to the um, might be might, might be quite that many, but it's around six steps up to the uh, up to the front door. Um, so it's likely that the result of that will be some form of um, either assisted entrance. Or um, or handrail provision or something similar, and we think that's the best that, that is uh, is is able to be achieved, Chair. Thank you. Come back, Chair. No, Bob, I mean, do you want to come back? You know, the point is, I mean, that's fine if someone's got has got some sort of ability to walk. But if you're a wheelchair user, that means that's a public access that's not possible, and it's a pub going to be a public building for for use for public. And disability legislation is quite clear that we should be able to access, or disabled people should be able to access. So I'm afraid I won't be supporting this one, Chair. Was that, Chris, have you got any comeback on that one? Um, no, I think that was more of a comment, Chair, uh, than, a, than a question. I think so. Although, is it follow up point, but uh, no, I don't think there's anything more I can add, Chair. We, we, we feel the building isn't. Uh, the physical situation with the building is is such that you can't uh, realistically provide a level access. Uh, so we, the condition requires that they do the best they can. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Hogan, you had a uh, question? Yeah, Councillor McCann's asked one of the questions, which is about disability access, which I was going to ask about because I was sort of concerned about that. Um, the second thing is, is there a difference in class between, is it a because is it a medical practice or a beauty salon, or is are they fall in the same class? Just as a question. Chair, uh, things have been thrown up in the air a little uh, recently with the change in the use classes order on the first of September. Um, what's been applied for is a beauty salon, uh, and a beauty salon is a sui generis use. Um, the Medical and health facilities are, are, well, sorry, the first point is we have to determine any applications that are still live with us um, in accordance with the regulations as they stood at the time that they were made. Um, so um, we're, we're dealing with the application that obviously that was obviously submitted pre 1st um, of September um, and uh, taking that to its conclusion. Yeah, this application was described and is described as a beauty salon and it's sui generis in any event. Um, the new Class E, which you may be referring to, uh, which came into force in the 1st of September, refers to health and medical facilities. Um, now, there, are, there is oodles of case law that deals with um, 
what use class um, beauty related uses are because a lot of them do cross over into health and medical areas. Um, but that's not what we've been asked to determine at the moment. We've been asked to determine an application for a sui generis uh, beauty salon. Um, and, and, we're, and we're determined on that, on that basis, Chair. Uh, the, the next question, the third question I was going to ha have um, was about um, travel to work plans for the people who work there, because obviously Broomhill is quite a congested area down that way. Do they have to perform, you know, because obviously the number of people that are going to be in the building, if they're all going to drive to that building, then that's going to take up a lot, a, lot, a lot of their parking, which will then displace the streets. Is there any requirement for a travel to work plan for their people who will be working out there for this type, this type of business? Uh, Chair, there isn't for this scale of development. Uh, there's a very small number of practitioners and, and a small number of uh, staff members that would be employed. Um, and their working hours would, would fall into the, the realms of the, uh, the, the permit parking scheme in any event. Um, so unless they obtained permits, uh, then, then they wouldn't be able to park in that area anyway. There are uh, there is, as I showed on the image, a couple of um, uh, spaces at the rear of the property which, which could serve as staff car parking, uh, if need be. Okay. Does that answer your questions, Councillor Huggan? Yes, Councillor Chris Rosin, yeah, Councillor Chris Rosin, Joseph, would you like to come in? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I've just been looking on Google Earth on the roadmap. And, and quite frankly, I, I've got to agree with Bob McKenna on this. They could put a ramp in there for disabled access. If we can stick one on the front of the town hall, we could certainly stick one on the front of this building. I'm not talking a straight ramp. It would have to uh, zigzag a little bit, but a suitable ramp could be placed on the front of that building for disabled access. And if I was part of a disabled group, I'd be boycotting that firm just to... That's probably more of an opinion than a question, but don't you agree that they could put one on there, Chris, if they, if they really thought about it? Uh, Chair, we did, in, we did investigate it, and uh, the conclusion was that there would be... Uh, the, the gradients would be so significant. You, you'd have a, a, a zigzag all, all the way up the front of the building and quite, quite likely wouldn't achieve the appropriate gradient in order to meet the uh, in other words it'd be too steep uh, to meet the um, to meet the step level uh, that was the information we gleaned when we discussed it and explored it with the applicant um, as I say there is a condition that requires facilities to provide it to be provided I don't think that that would result in a ramp um, we, we felt that a more appropriate provision was um, was things like handrails and, and assisted entry. Uh, yes, that might that might be an, uh, an issue for anyone who's who's in a wheelchair potentially. Um, but I'm not, I'm not saying that would automatically preclude them from using the building. Okay. okay. Does that answer your question, Chris? Well, chair, there are there are other alternatives to ramps. We have modern technology that that turns stairs into lifts in front of buildings. So you'd have stairs for ordinary people and you press a button it becomes a lift and it lifts a person up there are solutions to this for disabled access and i think nobody's thought of outside the box on this one just to i've, I've just got to got to say that to, to say a lot of disabled people out there that may want to use that type of facility i think there's a customer market somebody's missing here thank you chair okay thank you uh, is there any other member that wishes to ask a question? I can't see anyone indicating, so I'm looking for comments now. Councillor Adam Hurst. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, actually, it's just in the lines of what uh, Chris has said. Um, I mean, it's, it is difficult. I know that we can't be against something unless we've got very good planning uh, 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 reasons, but um, if I accept what Chris says, and I do, I think we should actually, before we make a decision, uh, ask for a fuller investigation around what the possibility would be for um, uh, disabled access 
and I would be reluctant to support it until that's happened. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay. In the light of that comment, then, I'm going to ask officers, is, that a, a, is there a way that we could change the conditionality to require some kind of, of access? Is that allowable under the legislation? Or are we, if we can't do that, um, I'll go back to the meeting and, and, and think about something else. Chair, the only thing that concerns me, um, we the condition could be expanded to require exploration, further exploration of the possibilities of providing a ramp. But I think it would be the, the work would be so extensive that they would probably require planning permission in their own right, um, and and that is something that's beyond the reasonable realms of the condition. Um, that that would be my view. Trisha's got a, a hand raised, uh, and she might want to add more to that. I've got uh, Chris indicating. I've got. I know that you want to come back in, Chris. Trish, I'll come to you first. Um, Chair, if it helps, um, there was a comment about um, whether or not the government requires that planning um, addresses dis disability, and of course it does, but the more stringent requirements are related to new build properties, and this property is an existing property. That's the first point. The second point is, yes, it's material, what the access, but in imposing a condition, um, it has to pass six statutory tests, and those are, has to be necessary for this development, has to be relevant to planning and to the development to be permitted. So we must consider to what extent um, these, these are met, has to be enforceable, precise, and reasonable in all other res respects. So, um, Requiring something that may require planning permission may not meet the necessary or the reasonable test. That's a matter for members to decide. But those six tests all must be um, satisfied in order to impose a condition. And we are being advised by our professional planning officer that he doesn't think it meets all of those tests. Um, and that would leave members with a decision as to whether they needed more information as to what's possible in terms of disabled access. Um, if they deferred for that, for more information, the only way it could be controlled would be through si these six conditions and having regard to an existing property. Um, so it looks like the report has addressed the issue of access and particularly disabled access. And, and formed a condition which meets the six tests and addresses insofar as an existing building can um, the access for disabled people. So um, th those are my observations and, and those are the rules around issuing a condition. And I hope that assists, Chair. Okay, thank you, Trish. Chris, you wanted to come back in. Thank you, Chair. There is technologies out there that converts a set of stairs when a disabled person comes along, the stairs flatten out, it becomes a walk-on, and then it lifts them up to the level and they walk off. They press the, the button when they get to the top and it reverts back to a set of stairs and it does it in reverse when they want to go out. The technologies are out there. I think these need looking at. I'm not going to vote against this proposal, but I think somebody needs to, to take this into consideration that those things are out there and just saying, oh, we can't put a ramp in, it's too steep when there are other solutions. There are engineering solutions out there. And that's all I would say, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Councillor McCann. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm, I'm agree with Chris on this. There are solutions out there and these should be applied. To say that it's a bit difficult for because it's an existing building, I, I don't accept. I don't think someone in a wheelchair would accept it either. And in a modern society, I think we've got to accommodate people of all, all abilities. So I will be voting against this chair. Right, I've got Trish indicating she wants to come back in. Then I've got you, Adam. Trish. Um, just to for you, Chair, just to clarify, um, I didn't say there was no requirement in existing buildings. I was saying that there were greater requirements in new bills, um, just to clarify that point. And secondly, um, it's um, available to members to discuss with the planning officer a suitable condition which addresses 
their concerns and meets the six tests. And that may be, um, it's not for me to say, but for example, um, the uh, requirement for a scheme in relation to the disabled access to be agreed um, as a condition. Um, but it's, it will be for um, the planning officer to decide, um, knowing the site better and the plan, planning policy. So hopefully that helps too, Chair. Thank you. Adam, you wanted to come with a comment? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, it, it's again listening to Chris, because when it first started, I, I was, you know, uh, around, you know, I, I do realise you can't always make every old building totally compliant. But I think if the technology is out there and it hasn't been considered, I'm pretty loath to vote for this pr uh, proposal on the basis that, is, that it would now cause some inconvenience. I think we have to actually send a message very clearly that we should be looking at all possibilities at the very beginning. And I'm sort of verging towards uh, voting against. Right, thank you, Adam. Right, it, it seems to be that there's quite a feeling in the, in the um, room. And I'm going to come back to you, Chris, on the basis of Tricia's advice with regards to um, a conditional requirement um, to require the scheme to provide disabled access. Um, is there some way we can strengthen the wording that would satisfy the feeling in the meeting? Well, I, I was just going to, I, one or two of the comments there, I just wasn't sure that members were fully aware of the condition that is uh, as drafted. So it's condition number three. Um, within the uh, within the report. So it says, before the building is brought into use, full details of suitable inclusive access improvements and facilities for disabled people to enter the building shall have been submitted to and approved, etc. cetera. Um, so to a large extent, Chair, I think the condition's already there. Uh, what, it, it doesn't say exactly how far they have to go in, 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 in pursuing that. Um, and I'm not sure it, it can really dictate to them something that we're not certain is possible uh, because it, as, um, as Trish said, it's about, it, ultimately it's about sort of reasonableness and proportionality as well. Um, and the, this is a difficult area because you, you know, you, you start to kind of um, risk uh, alienating uh, any one person. Um, but it is a very small facility um, and the, the level of work that would be required to make significant improvements, be that a ramp or a hoist or something of that nature, um, my own view is that they would be disproportionate to the level of, um, level of activity that will, is likely to be generated by, by the use. Um, because of the, the barrier that exists, uh, which is the, the, the level difference as it stands at the moment. Uh, there's also, uh, it's a separate matter um, that, that we would consider in any event, but the site is within the conservation area and, and the more uh, physical uh, alterations that take place to the building that then does start to, to raise that question as well. Um, so we thought that the, uh, that the version we have at the moment, which is requiring uh, improvements and facilities to enable people to enter, uh, was a, a reasonable balance, Chair. That, that's all I wanted to, to say. Okay, thank you. Michael, you indicated that you want to, wanted to make a contribution. Chair, sure, thank you. Uh, just a suggestion, really. I think, I mean, not to add to what Chris has said in terms of proportionality in relation to the application, but clearly, clearly th there's a will, um, not from not just from members, from, but from officers as well, because we have explored this as part of the application to see a ramp introduced. And I wonder whether a sort of a compromise is, a, is a, an appropriately worded directive to add to any notice if members supported the officer recommendation. Um, the that encouraged the applicant to look further into the 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 the, the, um, the options of a ramp moving forward, whether that does or doesn't require planning permission or is or isn't practical. But that encouragement for the applicant to actually explore that, and for them to be clear that actually it's something that members members wish to see. Okay, thank thank you, Michael. Councillor Garbert, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Um, that would be really good, um, but I, what I 
what I'd want to do was for that to come back once it's been considered, um, come back to planning uh, committee once that's been considered, um, in order for us to um, uh, make a, a judgment on whether or not um, it, it's acceptable at that point. Um, uh, I, I think um, my point of view on this is that uh, a lot of people have been saying it's it's too much to ask. It's, it's, it's but but we're talking about people who routinely meet these barriers and can't get over them because people have said it's too difficult to do. Uh, and I know um, you know it's an old building and it wasn't built uh, with with um, disabled people in mind, but it. It, this is something that routinely happens for disabled people. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we have to think about, it's a human rights issue, let's face it. And um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very concerned. So I think um, Michael's uh, suggestion is good. Uh, and I think um, it does need to come back to us um, to consider what's, what, you know, what, what's happened in the meantime, uh, so that we can then make a decision on it at that point. So is there a proposal in there, Councillor Garber? Yes, I think um, we'd accept what uh, uh, what Michael Johnson has been saying uh, about um, encouraging the applicant to uh, investigate further possibilities for um, uh, including uh, disabled people. Uh, and then once uh, we might want to put a time limit on that, maybe a month, a couple of months, um, and then uh, for it to come back to uh, the planning committee so that we can then make a decision on whether or not to, to pass this application. So is your proposal to defer until we have further information? Is that your, is that that, your proposal? Yeah, I think that would, that would cover it, yes. Do we, do we have a second? Uh, uh, Michael, you wanted to come in. I think, I think I ought to hear officers before. Thank you, Chair. Just to briefly explain what I said, because I think it's been um, just to make sure it was understood. I, I wasn't suggesting it was deferred um, for that for that particular approach. I think we, from an officer point of view, I think proposing a condition that asks them to submit details for our approval at a future date of access improvements to the building will mean that we'll have the opportunity to consider that. Now, I don't know if Councillor Garbett is suggest I know we got to the point of deferral, but I don't know if Councillor Garbett potentially is suggesting that that, that, that that conditions application is presented back to members um, because ultimately that, that they are the details that will be put forward. Um, what I was suggesting is a, is a directive just if members support the, today's recommendation um, to make it clear that members would like to see a ramp explored as, as, as part of that options appraisal. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, we, we verged away from that now. Um, I've got Adam indicating, and I'll come back to you, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're not far from doing this, but, but I do think I'm not happy about approving um, a, a proposal which does not have a ramp. I take all the officers' comments, which is it may just not be practical. You know, it cannot always be practical with every building. But I do quite like what uh, Councillor Garber has said, which is what was being suggested. Um, you know, yes, we, we don't want to flog a dead horse, but I would like to see a bit more consideration as to how much, for want of a better term, wheelchair access could be made practical before we made a, make a final decision. So if Councillor Garber is still happy with that, I would like to see that come back and the decision be deferred. Okay, so we've got we've got a proposal. Peter, was that a, was all right? Let me bring Tony in before I explore that, and then I've got Peter Price. <clears throat> well, all I wanted to say, I absolutely agree with what people are saying, but I would hate to send them away to come back with a proposal, and then we refuse planning permission because it's so intrusive. I mean, we need to we need to consider yeah, things. That's true. That's true. Peter. Yes, chair. I'll not support a deferment. I, I will support the officer recommendation. I've got faith in the officers that they will go away in good faith and, and talk to the, 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 the proposers of this plan application to the best within the circumstances. Uh, and I, I'm quite happy to leave it and trust them to it. That we, we agree they're subject to the uh, officers going away and trying to get the access for disability. 
that's it's practical. I lost you halfway through that, Peter. I'm sorry. Well, I just say I would support the after recommendation that that we agree we support this plan application, subject to officers going away and trying to negotiate better access for disabled people and coming back with a report. So that's the, that's the directive. Okay, no. I'm seeing lots of nods around the room here. So um, I'm going. I'm going with the. Okay, Peter, you you have a right to come back in. Come on. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm happy to go with that as long as it's not just a ramp that is being considered. That we also consider some of the uh, mechanical. Um, uh, um, solutions to this as well. You know, there are lifts, there are those uh, stairs that uh, Councillor Rosalind Joseph was uh, talking about that convert into a lift. Um, I've seen plenty of these on the outside of houses. They seem to work really well and uh, they aren't very intrusive in terms of the actual uh, space they take up. So, uh, you know, rather than just the ramp, uh, can you please ask for all possible solutions to be taken into account and looked at? Right. Okay, thank you. So, Alan, I've got you. I've got you indicating. No, I'm, I'm just, just agreeing with everything what's just recently said, particularly Peter. Um, I mean, we've, we've we've left this to officers in the past. They, they understand what what our sentiment is, and they're there with us. Let them go away and get on with it. It's obviously there. Let's get it done that way. Okay, so I've got a very clear proposal in front of the meeting, and that is um, that we um, ask officers. We ask officers to um, come back with a, a, a directive, um, and we can we leave uh, subject to, to to the approval. But we come back with a directive to um, yeah, Trish, you come in and help me out here because with we the word the planning application. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I think what um, I know you've got a proposal to defer, but it's not been seconded. Seconded. So at this point. Um, um, before it's seconded, I'll just point out that all of the um, objections to, to the granting of planning permission that have been mentioned relate to um, the type of access for disabled persons to the premises. And the planning officer has addressed that with a condition that requires information and a scheme in effect to be submitted to and approved by the council in writing. And Michael Johnson has added to that, that an informative directive to um, direct the applicant to consider the wider uh, possibilities for addressing that issue. So it seems to me that, um, that the matters that have been raised have been addressed in, in fact by condition and members in making a decision should consider conditions to overcome objections. And the planning officer advised that that um, does, does that because it defers um, the details until it's submitted. Um, so over to you, Chair. You can either take the vote or take the second in the a seconder for the deferral. Right. I'll. I'll but thank, um, thank you. As far as you can see, the deferral has got, has got no grounds now. Okay. It's over thank to you, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Trish. Right. Peter, are you happy to accept that the um, the direction added to the um, condition will strengthen the 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 demands that we're making? Yeah, I don't are mind that. Yeah, as long as we agree approval, uh, and, and then uh, officers can get what they want what they want really with the directive to go to all options. Okay, Deal thank you, Peter, Peter. I will also oh, Peter, accept Peter that. Peter you will accept yes. that. Okay, then in that case, we're going to the vote on the application. Um, and the vote with, with the understanding that um, should it be accepted, we'll um, ask officers to come up with a wording for a directive that will be strengthen the, the condition that will be um, agreed with the, the chairs. So the officer's report is to agree conditionally for the reasons that are set out be uh, below in the report. And I'm going to come to people as they were originally when I wrote your names down in the um, when we appeared before the break on the screen. So first of all, I'm coming to uh, Councillor Sanger. For the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Adam Hurst. Adam, you're on mute. 
Uh, it's just the same. I'm for the officer's recommendation with the caveats that have just been discussed and agreed. Thank you. Councillor Law. For the officer recommendation. Thank you, Alan. Councillor Tony Dams. For the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Peter Garbutt. For oh, chair. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor McCann. Again, Mr. Chair. Councillor Tim Huggan. For the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Zahir Inez. For chair. Thank you. Councillor Peter Price. For the officer recommendation, Chair. Thank you. And Councillor Chris RJ. For the recommendation, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Abby, um, what's, what's that by your calculations? And while Abby's counting, I do have to apologise. Yeah, I make that nine four one Clive again. trying to get me. Okay, thank you. So that, that, is, that, that is carried with the, um, the recommendation as the direction. Thank you. Right, can we let um, Jane back in now, please, Jay? And uh, she can take over and I can sit back and breathe a sigh of relief that they're not all that complicated. Oh, I love the way you were doing it, Diane. We want you to continue forever. <laughs> thank you. And um, thank you, Councillor Hurst. Just breathing a sigh of relief, I hear, as I came back in. <laughs> right then, lovely. Okay. Okay, back to the agenda. Item 6H, which is on application number 19 stroke 0033 FUL. Application is a full planning application. The proposal is retention of garage use as a cycle motorcycle store. Garage one, retention of triple garage. Garage two, erection of a single garage and alterations to existing bin stall. Garage three, erection of single garage and provision of a bin stall and covered cycle stall. Garage four, and retention of garden stall, stall one. The location is adjacent to 59 Daniel Hill Mews, opposite 75 Daniel Hill Mews, adjacent to Daniel Hill Mews. Um, S6 3JJ and the officer is Dinah Hope. If you could do the presentation, please, Dinah. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so this is an aerial shot of the site, uh, Daniel Hill Mews, and this is the, the development site here. I'm just indicating you can see, in fact, I go to the next slide. Uh, this is the extent of the Daniel Hill Mews development. Um, with the site of the various garages and stores shown in red. Um, the proposals include the retention of garage one, which is this uh, garage, triple garage here shown in, uh, quadruple garage, sorry, shown in the background here. So this is a, a garage that's already been erected. Um, it's uh, proposed to be used as a cycle store, motorcycle store, um, and it was actually built on the site of a previously approved cycle store. Garage 2 is a triple garage which has been built on three former parking spaces. Um, that's in the left hand picture here and uh, garage 3 uh, is, not a, is not retrospective, it hasn't been built yet and it will be built on um, the site of two of the car parking spaces shown in this um, photograph here. And it will sit alongside a reconfigured bin store. Again, garage four is not retrospective. Uh, it will comprise of a single garage, uh, a bin store and a cycle shelter. And it will occupy four of the parking spaces shown in the photograph here. And then the application also seeks uh, permission to retain this previously constructed garden store. Um, various structures are all single storey, uh, faced in artificial stone, uh, render and timber, um, as you can see from the plans here. Um, there will be a net loss of six parking spaces, as described in the officer's report, but, but it's considered that the demand for parking can be accommodated 
across the site. Um, there have been various planning applications over the years, as, again, as described in the officer report, um, culminating in, in a total of, I believe, 71 residential units. And following the development, there would be 78 spaces remaining. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have no speakers on the application, um, so I'll hand over to uh, questions from members. Any questions? No? Any comments? Comment? Councillor Garber, I've got for a comment. Councillor Garber. You're muted, Councillor Garber. I had my hand up for a question, but you, you Oh, so it. sorry. I'll go back to questions. So sorry, I didn't see you. Question, no, okay. Councillor Garber. Yeah. Um, obviously, uh, this is all to do with parking and, uh, and and how many spaces there are per how many um, units of um, living accommodation. Um, the recommendation is about two per uh, unit, isn't it? And um, at, at the moment, it's barely more than one. However, I do understand that there's quite a lot of cycle uh, storage provision. Um, does that help us meet that sort of uh, um, uh, proportionality for uh, the number of vehicles, shall we say, if you count cycles as a vehicle uh, per unit. I can come in briefly and then maybe Mark would like to come in. Yeah. The, 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 the guidelines, the parking guidelines, the maximum parking guidelines, um, and we have to take into consideration the fact that we're in a sustainable uh, location in the urban area. Um, uh, and and what we're what we're considering is the material impact of a loss of six parking spaces with the additional provision of the cycle parking and um, uh, motorcycle parking. So uh, I think on balance, given that we're considering a loss of six, um, as a, and, and that the guidelines are maximum standards, uh, it's felt that the proposal overall is, is adequate provision. That's uh, that's good. Um, the whole thing feels a bit sort of chaotic to me right from the start. There's a lot of um, um, different applications going on for various things and there's retrospective applications. Um, is, is, is there any comment to make on that? Because it feels it feels really, you know, almost as if it, it's they're making it up as they go along uh, with no plan. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that's a, a good thing or not. But what, what's the planning department's view on that? I, I can't really comment specifically no. on, uh, on that, but I can say, yes, you're right, that this, this application regularises um, a couple of uh, elements of the development that have occurred um, without planning permission, albeit you know, relatively minor. The development has taken a long time and, and has been carried out in, in a large number of phases. So I think it probably does feel quite piecemeal. Um, but as I say, considering uh, the proposal that's in front of us, part retrospective, part not retrospective, um, we're, we're comfortable with, with the recommendation for approval. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, nobody right. likes retrospective planning, but as the officer said, this is formalising something. So any comments? No. OK, then. OK, so the officer recommendation is to grant conditionally. OK, we'll go to the vote. OK, Councillor Diane Hurst. Four chair. Councillor Andrew Sangar. Four chair. Councillor Adam Hurst. Uh, four chair, and can I go and answer my door, please? <laughs> yes, you okay. can. Councillor Alan Law. <laughs> four chair. Councillor Tony Downs. Four chair. Councillor Peter Garbutt. Against chair. Councillor Peter Price. Four. Councillor Bob McCann. Four chair. Councillor Zahira Nas. Four chair. Councillor Chris Rosling Josephs. Four chair. And Councillor Tim Huggan. Four chair. Thank you, Abby. I make that uh, 10 for one against. Is that correct? 
That's correct, Chair. Thank you. I'm doing well with my adding up today. Okay, so that officer recommendation is supported and granted. Okay, so we'll move on to the final application today, the 6I. Okay, which is application number 20 stroke 02573 stroke FUL. 60 Highfield Rise, Sheffield S6, 6BT. It's a demolition of a single storey rear extension, erection of a single storey extension, and provision of render to rear elevation of a dwelling house. And I hand over to you. Can I just check if Adam has come back in before we start? He has, he's here. <laughs> it's fine, that's fine, Adam. You No, that's brilliant. Okay, Diana, hand over to you. Thank you. Where's she gone? Is she muted? Sorry, Chair. <laughs> sure. Okay, you've been talking to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, straightforward application, household application for a single storey replacement rear extension. This is the existing mm -hmm. extension here. Um, as you can see, both neighbouring properties um, already have single storey rear extensions. So while this proposed replacement will project 6.5 metres, it only uh, it projects beyond the neighbours by half a metre and 1.2 metres respectively, and it only has rear facing windows. So um, uh, the, the recommendation, officer recommendation is to approve. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we have no speakers. I'll open it up for questions. Any questions? Any comments? No, okay, so we're happy to go through to the vote then. The officer recommendation is to grant. So, Councillor Diane Hurst. Four, Chair. Councillor Andrew Sangar. Four, Chair. Councillor Adam Hurst. Four, Chair. Councillor Alan Law. Four, Chair. Councillor Tony Dams. Four, Chair. Councillor Peter Garbutt. Four, Chair. Councillor Peter Price. Four. Councillor Bob McCann. Councillor Zahir Anaz. Councillor Chris Rosaline Josephs. Four chair. Councillor Tim Huggan. Four chair. That application is approved. Okay, so we go on to the we go on to item seven on the agenda, which is a record of planning appeals and submissions and decisions. Michael. Chair, the only thing I think that I would just note is that the, we've had the appeal back for the old coroner's court mm -hmm. um, on Nursery Street, and the inspectors allowed the appeal to uh, um, you recall it was um, it was refused a, a, a planning committee in the town hall. I can't remember when. It feels like a long time ago now. Um, the inspector noted that the proposal would adhere to a number of the main character elements of its surroundings, It'd be built in red brick. It would reinforce the grid street pattern of development. You'll note that, um, it was refused ultimately um, on design grounds. Um, the inspector goes on to say when the design of the proposed building is considered in the round, he considered that it had been informed by the characteristics of its surroundings rather than being generic, safe or in a, unimaginative. Um, last accepting the existing building on the site is of merit to the area. Despite its state of repair, when taking the above considerations together, he considered the proposal would be of significant, sufficient high quality and would take adequate opportunities to improve the character of the area. And the inspector also sort of notes the other benefits that the scheme brings um, around economic benefits, housing supply, etc. Chair. So that's the only one I would bring to members' attention. I don't know if if, if Chair or, or anybody's got any questions about the other or if they want to raise mm -hmm. anything about. I shall open that to the floor. Um, any questions from any members on that? No, no comments, anything at all? Okay. No, thank you, Michael. Um, so we'll go on to item eight, which is the date of the next meeting, which is Tuesday the 6th of October at two o'clock. And uh, I'll probably see you all then. Thank you very much for a very long meeting, but we've covered a lot of... Uh, ground and we've had a really good debate i think i missed the best one <laughs> by the sound of it and uh, take care of yourselves and keep safe thank you